All right, we are live. Okay. Do, do, do. You ready? Suffocate. <clears throat> All right. Nope, not ready. Not ready. <clears throat> not ready to be live. Well, we are. We're on the camera. I'll go ahead and get started. I'm, and I just I just saw the ringer on my phone. I just went like, this is like the most awkward, awkward time. Like, I'll just call her now. Yeah. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. I'm getting a nosebleed. If I have to. If I go like this. Nerd. No kidding, man. Nerd. Ugh. Weak jeans right there. Okay. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> 12 years of Afrin abuse. This This shit's not good for you. Is that is that what's you know? Well, then why do you use it? Because you don't have you get addicted to it because it shrinks the blood vessels in your nose, and then if you don't, it's like the worst stuffed nose you've ever had in your entire life, and you will stop at nothing to get another hit. It's yes. literally an addiction. Tonight on wall. Yeah, addiction. So strikes dear leader. Between that and caffeine pills, my my stent as the morning uh, producer at WXNT, I got quite a few addictions from it. Wow, I just you know I just you know didn't those, think you would be addicted to something. Those are my vices, man. I just thought you just had like a deviated septum or something like weird nose thing. Is you that what get... the sniffing? That's what you that's, thought that was. I fi- I figure you just probably just had like some severe nose problem. Like maybe you know you broke your nose like in football or you know elbow to the face <laughs> no, or something. Nothing that cool. All right, here we go. Chair. It was a chair, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Uh, yes, I was uh, fighting a bear and. Welcome to We Are Liberals, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. Boy, will that come into play tonight. We examine <laughs> current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber at, on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. And in exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. Seriously, guys, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for you. So if you like hearing an alternative opinion, please support us on Patreon. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WALnews or on our Facebook group or Discord channel. All of those can be found at WeAreLibertarians.com. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Thank you to so many of you who are writing in. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we will bring you the headlines, which include WikiLeaks and Donald Trump Jr. We're going to cover Roy Moore. We are going to uh, talk sexual harassment. Uh, but before we get into Roy Moore, let me introduce my beautiful, vivacious, Mahogany skinned co host, Harry Price. I hope that doesn't come back to haunt me in 40 years, me uh, complimenting your beautiful skin. Oh, don't don't worry. The moment you sign that seven figure contract, it'll come right there with my book deal. I don't have 18 inches. Uh, that's for the, uh, <laughs> see, for the Patreon people, the people who donate five bucks, uh, if you give $5 a month and you get a private RSS feed and we leave the chit chat before we start the show and after the show and we it's it's stereo and higher quality and commercial free it sounds great and so you'd get that joke if you're one of the one of the 100 patreon subscribers so become 101 and you can understand what we were talking about at we libertarians.com or at patreon support us uh harry this is <laughs> <laughs> i have never been so ready for a show like there are there are times where we sit behind this microphone and i'm just like oh, god i hope these other guys have prepped for the show i'm just not into it tonight at all this is not one of those <laughs> nights i've got a lot to say uh, i'm ready to go yeah you seem to be on one ever since um i think it was probably thursday from 11 o'clock on yeah this this Roy <laughs> more thing has me triggered and uh n- and a lot of our people, <laughs> let me, we did a great job of growing the Facebook. You mean our people. I mean, yeah, my people. I, uh, I had done such a good job this month of growing the Facebook page, the big one. We, we were up over 87,000 people, 87, 200. I mean, I've lost a 200, us 200 Facebook likes in about four days. Oh, wow. 
because uh, I don't know. I just have a – I guess it's because my my stance on child molestation doesn't change based on party affiliation, and there are some people on that page that disagree. Now, th- this Roy Moore thing I think has really triggered me, and I've been questioned by several of uh, our subscribers, our fans. Like, why is this bothering you so much? This is an Alabama Senate race. This guy's not a libertarian. It doesn't concern you. Why are you so amped up by this? Several reasons. First, it is... uh, I read the story. (laughs) First, let me just say, I read the Washington Post story. And I think the the flat thinking of so many of uh, the people that you've been watching on Facebook with Roy Moore... Uh, The flat thinking, instead of the deep thinking, the critical thinking, Mm -hmm. has really bothered me on this. And Dear Leader has very few things that he's triggered by. Uh, I've been in politics and media, and, uh, like, I've I've got, despite what you may think, I really do have thick skin, and not a lot in politics bothers me. But because of my personal experiences with several friends over the years, like sexual violence and domestic violence are my triggers. And like, if you want to know why, go listen to episode 144 of this podcast with uh, Amanda's story. Like, that's why, because I've lived the life. uh, I've stood side by side with a friend as they've gone through domestic violence and dealing with the fallout of sexual violence. And uh, I, I know what it's, uh, whether you believe these women or not, if they're telling the truth, I have some insight into exactly what they've gone through. I've got many, many friends who have experienced sexual violence. And so to me, when somebody, I know the amount of courage that it takes to stand up and tell your deepest, darkest secret, the thing that has in many ways ruined your life for many years, and and the amount of courage that it takes to come out about that the courage that it takes to come out as a gay man or a gay woman, the courage that it comes out to say, I'm a victim of domestic violence, the courage that it comes out to say, I'm suffering from cancer, the courage to come out and say, I've had a miscarriage, Mm -hmm. uh, I've had an abortion. These very deep, deep, traumatic emotional wounds, uh, anytime anybody comes out and tells their story, uh, it's, it's for them healing and it's for us to listen. And uh, the Washington Post story about Roy Moore. And it just seemed like a lot of people on Facebook didn't. And it seemed at times over the last few days I've been arguing with people that are just completely, they just don't care (laughs) that people took the effort and the bravery, the courage to stand up and say, here's my story. So we're going to actually tell you what happened with the Roy Moore stuff. Um... I wouldn't vote for Roy Moore if he were literally uh, if he literally didn't have uh, like it, to to me Roy Moore is not somebody that I would vote for. Yeah. Like we talked about Roy Moore mm-hmm. a, a few weeks ago when he won, and like Roy Moore to me it doesn't matter if he's a Republican or a Democrat. Like he's just not somebody I would vote for, and he was unqualified to be a senator or a politician or somebody that has political power, regardless of this story. Right. But. So, so it's not politically motivated. It's just the – we're going to get into all the arguments and, and kind of break it down. But uh, I think for me, this story has signaled a true shift in the American electorate. This is the moment when we fully adopted Trumpian politics as a nation and the right especially adopted Trumpian politics. It doesn't matter what the allegations might have been. It doesn't matter how credible the women might have been. There's just a certain percentage of people that are going to cry fake news. And, you know, Steve Bannon came out and said, I'm basically quoting him. Steve Bannon said, you know, isn't it interesting that the Bezos, Amazon, Washington Post that dropped the dime on the uh, tape of Trump grabbing her by the pussy tape isn't it interesting that they're also the ones who did the the Bezos Amazon Washington Post are, are also the ones who dropped the dime on Roy Moore? Isn't that interesting that 
it really illustrates that we're in a fight between the establishment and the anti-establishment. And that's the moment when I like realized, all right, Steve Bannon is somebody that we've talked a lot about over the years as over the last year as somebody who could be an ally with us. But but that was the moment when I realized like this guy doesn't really care about principles or what's right. He cares about his own political power mm -hmm. and his own messaging and he's going to destroy whatever he has to destroy to get his own piece of political power, and that's not liberty. Correct. And there's a lot of people who are confusing anti-establishment, anti-power with liberty. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just, I was going to say, like, yeah, crushing everything that they believed in just for that, you know, well, I took out the establishment. I took out the guy that, you know, he... he took out the establishment power. They're basically willing to, like, destroy everything just to get this one guy out. Right. Which is which is crazy because it's like, the, the thing is, like, that Washington Post grabber by the pussy um, thing, that that was the, basically, every journalist was out there scouring the internet for anything. Anything, right. Anything. Because Trump and anything was clicks and it was money. Right. Granted, it was like, you know, to me it was a nothing burger, but, like, hey, you clicked the article. Someone needed to make money. Right. You know, and it, you know, it was instant information. And that was such red meat to the left. They ate it up too. Yeah. You know, so they did this too, but they looked at something and this, this is not a nothing burger. There's something here. Yeah. And, and you were actually kind of on my ass a little bit over the weekend. You were like, you need to calm down, brother. Like you need, you're going against men. You need to be on the on men's rights. And like, you just believe any accuser that comes out. No, I take this stuff case by case. Like, we're going to talk about some of the other cases. Like, we'll talk about the Sean Hannity case, where I just don't think that was a credible accuser. We'll talk about the George Takei case, where that's a single-source cited uh, case, and it didn't seem credible to me until his own comments on Howard Stern bit him in the ass. Yeah. You know, the Louis C.K. thing, which I'd heard previously because I work in the comedy industry, mm -hmm. and uh, it, and then it came out, and then he said, yeah, this is all true. Yeah. Um you know, and I think you have to take this stuff case by case because mm -hmm. anytime you have, I mean, you you can speak on you speak on this and and something you're passionate about, like, and it happened to me in my own Facebook group about a month ago. Like, anything can be taken out of context. You can take a screenshot in a group chat or mm -hmm. a, the wrong conversation, and you can twist that into something that if you have malintent, you can twist that to make that person look bad. Yeah. and completely pervert their intent to make them look like a bad person. Mm -hmm. And anytime somebody is accusing people of something, um, we should listen to them, process the information, and then decide if it's credible or not. And if this person, like, everybody's screaming, you know, what about, the, what about due process? Well, this isn't a, a court. <laughs> like, this yeah. isn't... The, the court of public opinion has always existed. The court of public opinion affected Bill Clinton. It affected Fatty Arbuckle 100 years ago or whatever. Like, go look up the case of Fatty Arbuckle, who was an, a Hollywood movie star at the wrong place at the wrong time and went through all these trials and basically had his reputation and career destroyed in the silent movie era because he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Like, yeah. yellow journalism was far worse at destroying people through allegation than anything we face today. So, you know, I've seen people referencing the Salem Witch Trials. We're not in the Salem Witch Trials, people. Like, they just, it, it isn't the Salem Witch Trials. All right, why are you making that face here? Yeah, I don't know. Have you gone back and really, like, looked at some of the historical context from it? It's, it's, um, there's, uh, right now, like, a, there's a lot of different stuff being lumped into all different things. Sure. Like, um, like the, uh, like the Weinstein thing, right? This is someone that it went to a went to a judge. They put a wire on it, and they've got like Hong Kong Korean information that went on this, right? right. Then the whole Me Too thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then this whole safety and numbers uh, bandwagon thing started. Like we know for a fact that people wants to be, they want to be inside what what is the um, you know the mainstream. They want to they want to be Twitter trending. They want to be up there. We know that people will do things and say things on the internet just to be with the trend. Sure. Okay. We know this. With the uh, when it comes down to that, it's like that everything else that comes like 
it's more of being um, suspect of every different allegation that's come out. Mm -hmm. When we attacked you in the group, we were mostly going like, you know what? I, you know, like, until I see a police report, I'm suspect of it. Do I believe the victim to understand it? Yeah. I am more system. Uh, I get the aspect of a, uh, somebody who was, as a child, right, taking time to process what's happening. That, that mm -hmm. makes sense to me, you know? Right. Having something hit you, mostly to, like, to be 19 or younger, something like that happening to you, that takes time. I get yeah. that. That's trauma. That you try to blame yourself, and you don't really kind of fully process that until later. That I understand. It's more of the adults and, and that's getting lumped into these different things. So, like, there's so much crap going around and everything's getting lumped together and they're not the same the louis yeah. ck thing is not the same as a weinstein thing okay right. the um the george takei thing right that is more uh that's more closer to the Corey feldman crap okay right than anything and that's in its own little different circle okay right. than when it comes to weinstein right grand like Corey feldman like he was on dr phil or oz or whatever one of those tv <laughs> doctor shows they actually call the police department which you know to me personally i um, um they this is actually I was listening to a, a podcast. Uh, it was the circling. Um, it was live stream of a uh, Monday Matt, the Monday Matt show. He was talking about like the a lot of these articles and a lot of these people are. It's such a big t trending topic right now. Yeah. They're doing it also for clicks and clickbait, right? Absolutely. So, like, it's almost like journalistic in integrity that they should be doing now. Like, hey, I will file this thing. Do you have a police report? Yeah, it, it's Have like you gone to the cops. It's yet? what we talked about with the Jamie Kilstein thing. If you listen to the Jamie Kilstein podcast with Joe Rogan, which I highly recommend, like he here's a guy who was a stand up comedian in New York City, came up with Doug Stanhope and Joe Rogan. Like, you know, th there couldn't be more free speech advocates than those two guys. Yeah. Like, and Jamie had this was on this podcast called Citizen Radio and became a male feminist and mm -hmm. a super progressive and like woke up every day trying to kill people on Twitter and ruin their reputation then one day he wakes up and Jezebel's written an article about him and basically at how he has sexually harassed women when really like he said a quarter of it was was true the other part of it wasn't all of it wasn't true and the one that was true I was just trying to get laid like a guy you know yeah. I was yeah. just trying to hit on a woman and so are we at a point in society where you can't hit on a woman like and so I thought it was it, it, you, you take the Jean Jean Ann Jean, Jean Ann Sacco I I don't know her total name but she's the woman who tweeted out like I'm going to South Africa I hope I don't get AIDS as she left England mm -hmm. landed in South Africa and Twitter had ruined her reputation because of Gawker and uh, the Gawker reporter had retweeted it she's been she's fired she's never really been able to work again this is years later yep. because when you Google her name this still comes up. Mm -hmm. Turns out that reporter tweeted out something. He was a victim of the Twitter lynchings, yeah. And he went back and talked to her and apologized for for making her a victim of the Twitter mobs. Like, and, and, the, so you've been publicly shamed is a great book about all this stuff that you know. And that's why I'm glad Gawker is dead. I'm glad Peter Thiel killed it because. Thank you, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> like, thank you, Hulk, because like the, the, there has to be some responsibility like i would never get on this program like someone sent an article about joe biden today that was on the gateway pundit and it was a a sort it was a secret service agent mm -hmm. they were not named it wasn't even clear they were a secret service agent it was just basically an anonymous source said that he has harvey weinstein activities and like yeah he's creepy with women yeah but like I'm not going to post that. I'm not going to read that. We're mm -hmm. not going to make that a topic on the show because it's the gateway pundit, which is like far right, has an axe to grind, posting an article with a single source that's unnamed. Like there's no there there. And like with this, it, there there's smoke. And like when you sat down and I put an article in front of you mm -hmm. that uh, that we'll get to, like you went, oh, man. And from the very beginning, I read the story. And, like, if you just read, like, when Sean Hannity, like, so so Sean Hannity was, uh, during all the Bill O'Reilly stuff, it was, uh, what's an, uh, uh, let's see, trying to find a date on this. I don't think there's a date on this anymore, but basically this is an NBC News article that sent Sean Hannity denies right-wing blogger sex harassment claim. And basically, Debbie Schlussel, Schlussel, I'm so bad with names came out and said that Sean Hannity never sexually harassed her, 
because she's a lawyer and she knows what that terms mean. Just it was creepy behavior. He hinted that I was uh, I was actually a size four when I was a size two and uh, that he wanted me to come back to his hotel room. And when I wouldn't sleep with him, he wouldn't have me on the air or whatever. And, you know, you read this article, you read her words and you read about the type of person that she is. And you go, okay, well, this woman's not a credible person. She clearly has an axe to grind against Fox and Hannity. Mm -hmm. uh, she's has a history of going after Hannity. So whatever is there, who knows what happened. But she also, you know, clearly doesn't say anything actually happened. She's just trying to jump on the bandwagon right. and make a name for herself. She's a she's an attention whore. Yep. Uh, and it's it, it's her coming out and saying like. Hey, I want attention, mm -hmm. and I want to jump on this O'Reilly bandwagon. And you know what I did? I went, trash. This is trash. Yeah. This is NBC yeah. shouldn't have even written an article about it. It's trash. It's like some of the I uh, like like right now IGN is coming out with a lot of this hitting this lot of this crap. But when they went after their sexual harassment case, they did an investigation. HR handled it. And can you they, can you explain what IGN is? Uh, it's a stupid magazine. I should. Die. <laughs> It's one of those. Uh, you really cracked yourself up there. Nobody Listen. knows what you were laughing at, but you were. <laughs> you you made you laugh, and Discord. All right, IGN is a video game. It was a magazine, also the internet kind of thing. They do YouTube videos and all these stupid, stupid things. They right. basically hire all these influencers and basically just dumb YouTubers in California, and they're all, but full of a bunch of social justice warriors. They suck on it. But um, the one thing that they do, like uh, this is happening, like you, if you search the IGN things going on, is that they uh, uh, one person claims sexual harassment on another person at their company. The HR department took control of it. They looked at what happened. And they basically wrote up. Both people, they figured they they found out they both had wrongdoing, right? The one woman in it that felt that she was wronged, and then left IGN, and then just broke this scathing piece about how H, the HR department like fumbled at you know like what you know fumbled like their sexual harassment case, but because they also like well they said I did something wrong, and it's like according to their policy you did do something wrong. They went right. after both people because they you know like you know and he said he's got you know it's just so much information they also don't know. Now, going back to the Salem Wish Trial thing, you've got lynch mo Twitter lynch mobs going after people on the different things, and then they get turned around, and then people also come after them, just kind of like the Salem Wish Trial. Right. A lot of people who accuse different people of the Salem Wish Trial, they, they also got accused back. Then people would accuse things for political reasons or just because people want different things, mm -hmm. or just some people would just keep accusing because just like this whole Twitter lynch mob and the SJW burn mob is just like... You know, they had to believe into it, and they kept going. You know? Right. It's it, it's sick because of the simple fact that if somebody's wrong on something, right, you've got to be able to – they have to be able to walk it back. Even mm -hmm. if, like, even if, like, if they say something and it's – you feel that it's, irre, you know, irreprehensible. This is, this is awful. This is the most horrid thing. That human being is still going to be there because they didn't take anyone's rights away. They didn't kill anyone. They just had a thought. And they said it aloud, and you don't like it. Right. Let them take that back. Show them why they're wrong, right? And shame them, but let them understand, like, hey, they can take this back and move on with it. No, I think for me, and, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that's, what's like, that's what's awful about the Twitter lynch mob. Like, and, it's, and they only really let so many different people take that back. Or some people just, like, as like, soon as it starts happening, they just get out and just leave. Josh Whedon just leaves Twitter. You know, they just yeah. left. I'm like, okay, not dealing with that. I'm getting off there. Yeah, I think uh, it, it, I've I've I, I'm no stranger to anybody that listens to this program. I'm a work in progress, and uh, I was raised like every other American male. And uh, there are a lot of things that I think we just pick up culturally that we don't realize as men how how they're perceived by women. And there were a lot of behaviors because I was, you know, I spent my twenties fairly codependent, and that's. You know, when you're like a people pleasing codependent, you're kind of mm. you're passive aggressive. You're like you're just gross, you know, and I look back at my behavior and I'm just disgusted by myself in a lot of the ways that like I, I was never like a uh, like a bad person, but like I wasn't a brave person. Yeah. I wasn't courageous with how I felt and and wouldn't say what I think. 
and uh, the friend that I was talking to when you walked in. Like, there mm-hmm. was a girl that I was in love with for, for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're friends now, but, like, I just think back to, like, how many times I was just, like, this passive-aggressive beta. And I should have just said to her, like, I know we're best friends, but I'm crazy about you. I want to marry you. You know, and she would have said, I don't think about you that way. Instead of, like, hinting yeah. and, like, getting mysteriously upset whenever she got a new boyfriend like all that just like stupid behavior like that that kind of stuff you just go that's not manly right that's yeah. that's not cool like and the friend that is in Amanda's story in so many ways like detailed all of that behavior mm-hmm. and showed me the behavior and pointed it out and said like here I know that you're not my abuser but you're giving me these red flags, and when you do this, it reminds me of him. And, like, I was so, like, horrified by the thought that I would even resemble somebody who, uh, who was that level of scumbag mm. and that level of evil, like, that I I changed my behavior, you know? And, and you just – you need women in your life to say, like, you're doing these things. And conversely, I think women need to be open to men in their life saying – you are doing these things, and here's how it's perceived by men. And I think a lot of women are. They do want to have the other perspective, but there are some women who don't want that perspective. Yeah. yeah this is the other thing is, like, uh, which it seems that just, like, the whole people in general just don't understand that you only get to see world through your point of view. Like, I, ha- you know, I have, my, I have my male point of view of the world. Right. I have that. Right, um, I was oh, I'm open and see more of the the female side of the world because of like uh, my wife. She's very open and shows me different things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a lot of different female friends, and they'll tell me like they'll show me all this different stuff because I remember growing up. It's like I had no idea catcalling really happened in Indiana. I had no idea freaking idea, freaking idea until like you know like you just ask you know like I had to ask and open it up. Now granted, you know you know that's how you you have to ask a question. Yeah. You see something happen and I'm like does that happen? Does this really happen? Mm-hmm. You know, I thought that was just in the movies or some people really exaggerating this crap. Oh crap. It's real. You know, cause you know, like I've never seen it happen in front of me. I've never done it in front of people. I've never done it. You know? So it's like, it's, you know, that, you know, that, like I said, it's that other part of the world. You just don't get to see. Well, I think there's, and, oh, 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 sorry. I thought you were just, No. Uh, and then the, well, the other thing is like uh, a lot of these different, like uh, with, with these circular harassment cases, a lot of it, it's a lot of, how can I put it? It's a lot of it, a lot of um, human interactions, like flirting and the uh, like, just different aspect of just like asking someone else. This seems as annoying and unwanted sexual like uh, harassment, but a lot of it is just seems like, like I said, like it just seems like flirting. You didn't want it from this person, and instead of like in telling this person and having this person go off, they decided to make it into a huge monster like sexual harassment case and stuff like that. Well, now, I, now I'm not excusing. Yeah. No, oh, I just got to say this, Captain. I'll sure. let you go. I'm not excusing any of that p- pickup artist crap, where like you know, right. some woman like buys you, you buy her a drink and then you take power back and smack her butt. I'm not. No, that is wrong. Don't do that. If you, I'm if, not saying that. I, I'm sure we <laughs> have. A, them. I'm sure we have a lot of young guys that are listening that aren't great with women. A lot of middle aged guys that aren't great with women. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. But there is a a great podcast called uh, The Mating Grounds, which you can go and listen to. And they wrote a book. Tucker Max, who wrote they, I hope they serve beer in hell. Yeah. And assholes finish first, and then Jeffrey Miller, who is a, a, an evolutionary psychologist, like Tucker is a different person <laughs> than he was in his in his bachelor days, let's say. Uh, but he basically put together this book because he was like, I lived like a pickup artist asshole for so long, and that was the wrong way to treat women. That was the wrong way to live. And if you want to know how to get women, here's how you get women. And he wrote this book and did this podcast, Mating Grounds, and then I think the book was called Mate. Yeah. Um, basically about how to how to be attractive to the other sex. It's good for women too. I mean, mm-hmm. it really, but it really taught me a lot. Uh, and the core of it is be a good person. Define what your goals are as a person in in the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial realm. And then achieve your goals, and the more you achieve your goals, then the more people will be attracted to you, and then it, you won't even have to worry about trying to pick up women because people will just be attracted to you. You yeah. don't have to worry about picking up guys for our lady, our lady listeners. Like, 
if you just try to be the best version of yourself, then you you will uh, you yeah. you will be attractive. And mm-hmm. so much of all of these stories are, really comes down to that. And I've been listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson, and I know that's cliche at this point, but like Jordan Peterson is in so many ways like a brilliant thinker that I wish I were I wish I were smart as he is, but. Uh, I watched him on the Rubin Report, and then there was this great six-minute clip that uh, I'll put up at wearelibertarians.com where he's talking. It, basically, it's about how his foundations came together and how he became religious. But what Jordan Peterson talks about, the basis of his philosophy, is that when he studied Nazism mm-hmm. and he studied the Ukraine and he studied the Holocaust specifically, he realized these were regular people. Like, there's a book called No Ordinary Men, and, uh, man, I wish I could remember what the the book that I read that was about the guy who ended up running Treblinka, and, like, this guy was just a cop. He was a cop. He didn't want to get killed by the Nazis, so he just went along, and he ended up in charge of Treblinka. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and No Ordinary Men is just about the guys who are part of the Einzugruben who went and just, ma- like, committed mass murder just regular soldiers, regular family men, regular guys. Like Jordan Peterson just at a certain point realized every one of us has the capacity for great evil. Yeah. And and I think it's so true. Like we don't realize that our choices, we have the capacity for great evil or great good. Like human beings are not good or bad. Roy Moore is not good or bad. Donald Trump is not good or bad. There's different shades of these people. You know, you can, you know, uh, uh, Stalin was a good grandfather, but he also killed like 30 million people, (laughs) you know. uh, Locked his son in prison. Right. Like there. And so every time you open your mouth and every time you press tweet and every time you interact with another person and every time you you uh, interact with the world you are making a moral choice to add good or bad to it into the world. And I just look at the Roy Moore thing and I just go, are we as a society choosing moral good or moral bad? Because it it is a choice. This is a time for choosing. And I think that there are two ways to look at politics. Uh, You know, and, and we've talked about both over the years there is the win at all costs way. There is the Donald Trump way of doing politics where it doesn't really matter what you do and say as long as you win. And winning is all that matters. And, you know, Donald Trump is anti power and anti establishment, but you don't really know what he believes. He just wins. And Roy Moore is sort of like that. You don't really know what Roy Moore believes. He's just on this team. And so you're going to follow it. Yeah. And it feels good. And it feels good that, like, you know, forever Republicans and the right have been just sitting on the sidelines and taking the abuses of like, well, you know, I got caught in a bathroom tapping my foot, and so I'm going to sit down. And then, you know, once in a while, we'd like a Donald Trump or a Roy Moore to come along and say, yeah, I dated a 16-year-old when I was 32, but I'm not going to give up the fight because you don't want to elect a Democrat. Like, here's David Horowitz. Here's a guy. David Horowitz is uh, a longtime you know, conservative thinker and uh, runs front page mag and was a former communist and is on the fringe right, I would say. Uh, And Red State writes this. Red State is a conservative blog run by Eric Erickson, and it's and it's writing this. Um, This one tweet, this is called David Horowitz. Sure, Roy Moore is a child molester, but vote for him anyways. This one tweet encapsulates everything that is wrong with our politics today. This is the logical endpoint for a party that has rationalized away the glaring character effects of Donald Trump. Once you auction off your soul for the promise of political gain, it becomes easier and easier to justify literally anything done by one of your own. Now we have someone, David Horowitz, who is literally saying, I believe our Senate candidate once sexually molested a 14-year-old girl and is lying about it, but vote for anyways because Democrats. Uh, So, uh, let's see... He, they, I didn't get the embedded tweet, but basically he, he came out and said, like, I believe the accuser. I believe what she was saying. I don't care because I don't want another Democrat because he's going to stand up for what is right, what is good. But is he? 
Like this is literally the the this is the literally we've reached. I hope, but we haven't because again, every person has the capacity for good or evil. This is the logical conclusion: Donald Trump and Roy Moore of voting for the lesser of two evils. Yeah, you know, and so you can vote for people because you want to win because they'll enact your ideas and you don't really care about character or you can look at politics as a moral venture and it does matter who you're electing it does matter who you're putting into positions of power it does matter who you're putting in positions of power in companies in cultural institutions in politics like we are promoting we are and i think part of the reaction and I want your reaction to this. Go finish before I bring up that point. Say what you're about to say. Oh yeah, you, I was going to say like you, you're right. It is important to know the people behind it. With when it comes to everything, technology, anything you're going to get into, you know, they can say what they want on their like white paper of like a like a cryptocurrency or on their front page. This is what we believe in. But if the people that are behind that um, mm-hmm. that statement, if they don't like live that, they don't. They're not that type of culture. That's bull crap. That you know, like the whole like. Well, Google said do no evil yeah they say that but are they that now we are libertarians if we post a video it is automatically demonetized now and to contest that i have to have a video hit a thousand views and uh we never hit a thousand views on a video so there's literally no way for a small independent media outlet to get monetized on youtube anymore wow so and i'll tell you what's going to happen with facebook here's what's going to happen with facebook and twitter because of the pressure Facebook, all they want is you to show up to their platform and have a good time. They want to invite you to a party that you want to attend. And in the Trump era, in politics, in in the advertising platform that they encourage, they're pumping too much junk into your feed, and so you are leaving the platform. And so what they want to do is they're going to end up, mark my words, in two years they will segregate a family feed that you will spend all your time in and a page feed where you will see things like We Are Libertarians posts. And they will filter out all of the things that are political. They will filter out anything that is news-related. They will strike partnerships with people like the New York Times and uh, you know these major pol- pub- publications. So We Are Libertarians, that's why it's important for you to sign up for our email list, to go to our website, to download our podcast, because in two years' time, we're not going to be able to use and reach you on social media because they're introducing legislation to cut off advertising. So I'm not even going to be able to advertise to to you at a certain point to get you to come to our page. And the only way to grow a Facebook page or a platform now is to shitpost. There's literally no other way to get organic reach. Like, go look at the reach for our posts. It's like 600 people see when I post the podcast on our Facebook page. Ouch. But if I shitpost a Roy Moore thing... It's 30,000 people. So as a content creator, somebody who's trying to make a living as an independent content creator, what should I do? Should I post responsible content that you want to see that I think is good for public discourse? Or should I shit post and get people pissed off and commenting on it so you see our brand? Like So there, there's a real problem with these platforms that they're going to solve by shutting people like us down and it starts at the top. It starts with liberal people at the top who judge libertarian, conservative voices on YouTube as bad, demonetize them, except for the ones that we, that we with the Ben Shapiros, that we strike ex- a partnership. Yeah, they're acceptable. Right. They're the acceptable ones. They're inside this one type of bracket. Right. We will accept these because they will... Sp- they will play ball in their ball house, you know, but that's speculation. But this is something you are right. This is something that Facebook has done. The whole reaction thing. Mm-hmm. That's just some. That's just machine learning to find out what what, what do you like? What right. makes you happy? What are you shocked about? Mm-hmm. You know, that's there to learn on to. Um, they are experimenting with the uh, whole groups things. You're noticing like more ads in groups because people fled to groups because they were tired of the main hose feed, you know. And if you also notice that you now this one's really cool. If you if you ever notice that. Uh, if you're not getting all your notifications, I I get like a I don't like I that that number bings sometimes and I go and I click on it and I don't see anything. There's something else at the top. That's because the Facebook algorithm is trying to just be like, well, this is what you should look at. Yeah. When you have other notifications on there, because I miss things so much because of the simple fact that Google, uh, Facebook figures I shouldn't look at that. Mm-hmm. So I'm having to 
So what I had, like, uh, like I was in this huge poke war with Christy, right? And then right. I just stopped randomly. It's because the simple fact that Facebook decided, huh, I'm going to remove that from his notification feed. So I'm at the longest time, I just think I poked her. It's done. I finally won. I beat her. <laughs> Up until the time she goes, no, you didn't. I poked you. You haven't poked me back. And I'm like, no, I've been poked. And I've just been sitting there getting poked. Um, so I had to go into, uh, I created and uh, opened up a brand new browser user, had to set it up and like maintain it. So like it just opens up just in notifications and bookmark. It's just a huge, massive feed of just notification to the main notification page, main poke page, main Facebook. And I have to go to these bookmark parts and I'm starting to use facebook more like a bbs than like how facebook was meant to be used because that's how i want facebook to work right and it's and like sometime this this week i was like i just didn't like i think on like sunday or monday i can remember like i just like left facebook for four hours right you know because usually just sitting there in the corner because you know the the wall chat or other things the news feed is just going on to it and it's just like wow this has become unuseful this isn't useful anymore yeah just, I, the main purpose that I had this thing to get news and communicate with people, I can't even use it for that. I've, I've started unfollowing my posts, and then when I feel like I am emotionally prepared to deal with stupid people, I go I go to my Facebook posts and I go to the wall posts and I respond. Hmm. And and it's so funny because somebody in the Discord chat said, "Isn't it funny to see all these people talking shit to him on a post where he said he's unfollowing his own post, and they are too dumb to realize he's not paying attention to it anymore?" <laughs> And it's be- and and you know what I read a whole book on Sat on Sunday called Manning Up about mm-hmm. uh you know how promoting women has really robbed boys of a lot uh, millennial boys of a lot of opportunity not opportunity but of growth of growth yeah we we've, we've sacrificed male growth for female growth and by tilting the scales now millennial women are going where are all the real men at. <laughs> And so it's a really interesting book. Uh, I put a, the video uh, by the author up at WeAreLibertarians.com, Kay Heimowitz. And it, I did that because I put my phone in the bathroom because I just – when I woke up Sunday, I said, you know what? I'm tired of looking at my notifications. I'm annoyed by Facebook and the comments. And so if I put my phone in the bathroom, reasonably I'll go to the bathroom every two to six hours so I can check my – you know, check my phone when I go in there, and uh, that's what I did. And I read a whole book. I haven't read a whole book in a, in like two years in a day. Like it was 150 pages, and I knocked it out in like three or four hours. Like, so you you really uh, you have to get off your phone. You have to get off these platforms, but they don't want you to do that. But it's all designed for serotonin hits. Like Instagram logs the times of day that you get onto Instagram. And then when you are most likely to get on, they will dump likes. They will withhold likes, and then around, let's say, you get on uh, Instagram every night at 730, they will start dumping the likes that you actually got hours before at that time to get you to open up the app to see, oh, my friends like this stuff. So, like, the likes, it, 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 it isn't in real time. It's all designed to get you... To have those little quick serotonin hits in your brain, that's mm-hmm. why we love like the iPhone games because you know a Clash of Clans, uh, not not Harry because he likes real games, but like okay, casual. That's why Farmville got so addictive is because it's serotonin hits in your brain. So, so we we and, and we get serotonin hits just when we when we have comments, and so that's why we like all this argument on Facebook. Can I tell you that yeah. I use Instagram as an alarm because of that reason? Really? Because if you check you if you just check Instagram like really early in the morning, like when you want to get up and you know when you want to wake up, you just do Instagram. Then it'll just go off. Like did that this me this morning, just seven a.m. Bing, 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 bing. bing. <laughs> so, yeah. Woohoo. I'm up. I'm up now. So I just I think it's really important for people to think about, uh, you know, another thing that uh, was said in that video by Jordan Peterson that I thought was really um, was it Jordan Peterson? I don't I don't know who who said this. It, was the, the correct Peterson? Uh, it's some. It was not Austin Peterson. Um, so it was. It, we. We have siloed ourselves, and technology has allowed us to silo ourselves into our groups because it is easier to just think that everybody thinks the same way as we do than to challenge ourselves with beliefs that might be bigger than our reality. 
Uh, because it, it was the first episode of the Jordan Peterson podcast where he's talking about uh, religion. And he's basically – what he was basically saying is that as individuals, we have a moral imperative to improve ourselves. And if we can shove the moral imperative of self-improvement off onto another group, let's say you can blame blacks if you're a white guy – or it is those SJWs that are causing all my problems, or these cis white gender, these cis white males are causing all my problems. It takes the imperative of improving yourself off of your plate and puts it onto an identity that you oppose, and that's a huge problem. And so we start to only congregate with people that we agree with ideologically and politically and in lifestyle because. It, that's that's order. We want order because if we have chaos, people are terrified of chaos. You don't like chaos. And having a conversation with somebody that you might disagree with might challenge your brain to have to think about your beliefs in a way that you never thought about. It might challenge those beliefs. It might rattle your order and might cause you to have to believe something different. And so therefore, it's just safer to stick with your own kind. And the internet has weaponized this, and that's why you get people who don't even read articles. They don't even read things. They they just stick with things. That's that's why we don't do that on the show. Like we we are libertarians, and we believe in liberty, but we talk to different kinds of libertarians. We talk to Democrats. We talk to Republicans. We talk to about societal issues. In a way that isn't left or right. Like I said, I could make way more money if I were Tommy Lauren yeah. and just screeching. I could make way more money if I were uh, Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos. I could make way more money if I were Rachel Maddow. We just, you, you, you have to do a lot of work to be Rachel Maddow. Yeah, but or yeah, Tommy Lauren. Yeah, but if we uh, went straight conservative, you know, we'd probably be on the radio. We could probably, yeah, you know, even we, even if I went up. even if I went the Roger Paxton route and started just appealing to black and yellows only. There's there's you know, I could get a sweet camper next to uh, Chris Cantwell oh, in New Hampshire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, And I'm not saying Roger doesn't believe exactly what he says. He does. That's why I support Roger and promote him, because he does believe exactly what he says. But it's much harder to sit there. And, and he's completely separated from Christopher Cantwell, too. It's, right, exactly. It's it's that. just harder. Right. You, like That's what I love about our audience, and that's why you support this show, and that's why I am so glad that we have a home for you, because we question everything. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we we fit nowhere, so we fit together, and that's why it's important for you to continue to support the show because we're 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 in a desperate need where we have to have our preconceived notions, our biases challenged. Yeah, because it's so important to do that in a time when everybody else has this flat thinking. Yeah, yeah. Go out, challenge your biases, uh, understand that you have them, and it and it's not. It's something your brain will naturally do. You will confirm, know your biases, but as long as you understand what your principles and what you really want out of life, you can go and just go and investigate and see what the the, uh, the other side is talking about. Yeah. Be able to argue, um, like I said, the best way to argue leftists or the people on the right is to know their points better than they do. Yep. Uh, if, like, go ahead, pick up Das Kapital. You know, and it's not going to turn you into a socialist. It's just going to let you understand this book that they have never read. They may believe everything about things that's in it, yep. and they've kind of heard it offhand, but they have never touched that book. Yep. You know, just like how they will talk about Atlas Shrugged, and you look at them like, have you actually read the book? It's almost why I kind of hate our audience a little bit, Harry, because they question me so often. Like, <laughs> but I like it. Like, uh, I don't even know how to say his name, Brit Britannico. Yeah. I don't know how to. I, it's it's some weird name, but I'm sorry, dude. You, I love you, but he's all weekend. He's been like, "What's your deal? What's your deal? What's your deal?" I'm like, "What's your deal? You're a Patreon subscriber. Why are you in my face?" But I want that. I want him to challenge me with points mm -hmm. because it made my arguments for this episode better. Yep. And I've listened. I listened to Ben Shapiro, and like I've got to tell you, like the last four days of Ben Shapiro, wow! Like this dude, I I didn't realize that he was like that. He and I agreed on so much, and he's a conservative. I can't stand his cadence. Uh -huh. he, he does sound like a nerd, but as as a high voice tenor, a high tenored male. Uh, nerd, I, I have to give another high tenored nerd respect. I'm just saying, I would have shoved him in his locker. If we I know. The same I would have punched him. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, you've got to listen to the Young Turks. You've got to get out there and you've got to listen to Democracy Now. You've got to listen to yeah. Glenn Beck. You've got to listen to this stuff because you want to understand what 
the people that you're talking to on a daily basis are consuming. That's why I read the New York, New York Times and the Washington mm -hmm. Post. Like, yeah. you got to understand all of it. And uh, I'm trying to do my best to consume as much as I can and synthesize it for you. I've started posting, like, real quick, short posts, all the stuff that I'm consuming every day. Uh, I'm posting up at wearelibertarians.com, almost like a Tumblr. Uh, so I've got my own Tumblr now, wearelibertarians.com. Do we actually have a Tumblr page? We do have a Tumblr, actually. Oh, oh yeah. there, you go. <laughs> there is a Tumblr, but uh, it auto-publishes all the posts from wearelibertarians.com. So go go <laughs> check that out. Yeah, I've been posting a bunch of stuff, and I'm going to continue to to post all my show prep as I do it through the week. Like, at work, I do all kinds of different things, and I just watch YouTube and uh, I, talks uh, and stuff. So. Personally, I just can't wait till Dear Leader gives the uh, Twitch channel some love and uploads some videos on the Twitch channel. Well, if yeah. somebody would let me have the password to my own damn Twitch channel. First off, I logged into your laptop. Um, I am not going to give... Even if I give you the password, it would deal you no good because you would need my phone to the 2FA on it. But you can easily, we can coordinate. I can type in the password. You can know when I'm doing it now that we have modern technology. And then I can log in at work where I can upload some videos. I mean, I do that at home. So let's talk <laughs> about Roy Moore. <laughs> crank call, crank call. Uh, yeah, we all know about Cut my. That out. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's just a uh, never mind. Um, so let's let's actually go through the Roy Moore stuff. Uh, okay. Fifty minutes into the episode, <laughs> when I said we get to it on the hour episode. But I do want people to understand uh, the, the the mindset that we take when we view this stuff. That I take when I view it, and uh, and talk a little societal stuff too. So the Washington Post on Thursday, November 9th, posted a story that says, Woman says Roy Moore initiated sexual encounter when she was 14. He was 32. Now, I am 34. How old are you, Harry? 32. All right. You are 32 years old. I am 34. Let's say I, c I show up tonight with a hot date, mm -hmm. and she's 15. What do you do? Well, we've not had sex. We're just dating. You're just dating. We're just going out to the movies, holding hands, maybe a little kissing. But she's she's 15. What, what, what state are we in? <laughs> Doesn't is it? Don't give me. Listen, <laughs> this is the guy. This is the problem with you fucking anarchists. OK, oh, I don't like the state. I don't like the state. Well, I'm dating a 15 year old. But what, I just what want... does the state say about consent? No, I just want to know. Is are it, we in Ancapistan? Is it? Are we here at Indiana? No, you Mary Ruart pervert. It's uh, <laughs> that's, that's unfair to Mary. I love Mary. Like <laughs> in Ancapistan, as long as you paid for her. See, that's why I would never be an anarchist. Uh, you're, you're really, you guys are. That's, not... that's making fun of the point of anarchist, and I'm, don't send me like a bunch of bad email because that's. I know it's a bad freaking joke, and anarchists get it. All he the time. was that, kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding. Based that stuff on won't happen. But but perfectly... based on, let me ask you this: based on your own personal morals and uh -huh. values, mm -hmm. Chris Spangle shows up to the next wall pool party, and his date is 15, and he is 34. What do you all say? First off, I try to find out, is this a joke? Are you really dating her? Then if that's the case, then I will try to separate you two, get her parents, and get you guys away from each other. No, that's a no-no. Now, let's say, that, no -no. let's say that this is a pattern in my life, and there are several women in my life that I am dating that are 14, 15, and 16. Well, Let's say my coworkers... Like his coworkers back in the day, an assistant DA that he worked with said everybody knew Roy dated sixteen year olds. I think you have a problem. I think you probably need to get it. You know, like you need to deal with that, right? Because that, um, sorry, that uh, you you can have age of consent conversations. I don't have those. Don't send them to me because I won't have them with you. But yeah, if that, we're going to talk about it because I already got to get a scheduled inter uh, intervention for your other addiction. So, you know, so we'll do one for that one too. And I'll make sure you get the help that you need because that, you know, that's just not normal in our type of culture right now. I Thank get you. the age of consent conversation, but I'm too bad. It's 20 freaking 17. And this is, you know, that's says the dad of a new, uh, of a daughter, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's what I want people. I want people to start with their own personal principles. Like what do my personal principles say about this situation? And then think about the politics of it second. Like I think a lot of people are putting their personal principles on hold for the sake of, a, of, of what is right politically and saying, I, I, I read this, I acknowledge that this is bad, or I, I, and I'm just going to cry fake news. Uh, so let's actually hear, let's see what happened. Uh, Lee, Lee Kaufman uh, in 1979 
there's also Wendy Miller, 16, Debbie Gibson at 17, and Gloria De- Deason at 18, which, like, the 18-year-old story, so they say four accusers, but I'm going to give Roy Moore a pass on the 18-year-old because he was, like, 32, 33. He was dating all these women at, like, the same time. Uh, yeah. And, like, he had family permission. They never did anything but kissed. Like, she was 18. It was it was perfectly, you know. Above board. Right. S- sort of. Right. It's still weird. It's the other stuff. that It's like the Lee Korfman. It wasn't that Debbie Gibson, Rick Irvine. So she says that when she was 14 years old, an older man approached her outside of the courtroom. Uh, she was sitting on a wooden bench with her mother, and they both recall this. The man introduced himself as Roy Moore. It was early 79, and uh, the now Republican in Alabama uh, was a 32-year-old assistant district attorney. And he struck up a conversation with Korfman and her mother and offered to watch the girl while mom went inside for a child custody hearing. And he basically said, you know, you don't want your daughter to hear all that. I'll take care of her. And uh, she thought it was just nice. Nancy Wells thought it was nice that an assistant district attorney would have a conversation and watch her. Because he was an he was a trusted elected official, a district attorney, yeah. a man of power, a man of position that had been entrusted uh, with by the people. Alone with him, uh, Moore chatted with her and asked for her phone number. Days later, she picked up her phone and uh, ran out. And he drove her thirty minutes into the woods, told her how pretty she was, and kissed her. And on a second visit, he took off her shirt and pants and removed his clothes. He touched her over her bra and underpants. And guided her hand to touch him over his underwear. I wanted it over with. I wanted out, she remembers, thinking, please get this over with. Whatever this is, just get it over with. Korfman then asked Moore to take her home, and he did. Um, Two of her childhood friends say at the time that uh, she said she was dating an older man, and uh, they confirmed that story. Um, Three other women by the Washington Post were interviewed and uh, he pursued them in his early 30s all around 1979. The weird thing about these stories is that it all happens in 1979. Not 80, not 78, all 79. Yeah. That's the other thing thing. with that story when he drove her in the woods and did all that. That's 79. She didn't have any cell phone, no way to contact anyone. And when they like phone, that's a house phone on a wall. Right. So the Wendy Miller story, she was 14 and working as Santa's little helper at the Gasden Mall when Moore first approached her. And when she was 16, he asked her on dates. Now, when she was 14, he walked up and said, you look very cute. And she said, thank you. And she was 14. And, uh, you know, the Debbie Gibson was 17 when Moore spoke to her high school civics class, asked her out on the first of several dates that did not progress beyond kissing. Gloria Deason said she was an 18-year-old cheerleader when Moore began taking her on dates that include bottles of rosé wine the legal drinking age was 19, so he – underage drinking, big whoop. Um, so Moore denied the allegations. These allegations are completely false and a desperate political attack by the National Democratic Party and the Washington Post on this campaign. Uh, the campaign said in a subsequent statement, this garbage is the very definition of fake news. He went on Hannity, and he basically was stuttering and said, I think I might have been friends with the 16-year-old. I don't mm-hmm. really know. I don't know any of these other women. It's like, well, you don't know any of the women because they were girls when you were trying to kiss them, dude. Yeah. Um, so a bunch of other people have uh, asked him to step down. So he's running against yeah. Doug Jones, and he beat Luther Strange. She's now 53, and she works as a customer service rep at a payday loan business. She voted for Republicans in the past three presidential elections, including Trump. She says she thought of confronting Moore personally for years and almost came forward publicly during his first campaign for state Supreme Court in 2000, but decided against it. Her two children were still in school and then, and she worried about how it would affect them. She also was concerned that her background, three divorces and a messy financial history, might undermine her credibility. There's no one here that doesn't know I'm not an angel, Korfman said. Uh, Korfman described her story consistently in six interviews with the Post. The Post confirmed that her mother attending, they basically went to the courthouse and and confirmed the divorce proceedings, uh, and Moore's office was down the hall. Uh, Neither Korfman nor any of the other women sought out the Post. Complete opposite of the Hannity accuser. They didn't seek out the Post. The Post found them. Uh, They... 
While reporting on a story of in Alabama about supporters of Moore's Senate campaign, a Post reporter heard that Moore allegedly had sought relationships with teenage girls. Over the next three weeks, two Post reporters contacted and interviewed the four women. All were initially reluctant to speak publicly, but chose to do so after multiple interviews, saying that they thought it was important for people to know about their interactions with Moore. The women say they don't know each other. So when you have four cases, now five, and it's a pattern, that should tell you something. When you have somebody who isn't willing to come forward and then does, says that they're not in it for the money. Uh, you have somebody who thought about forever coming out and saying something. Well, it's been 40 years. Why is this bring? Well, why are you still bringing up uh, all of Clinton's accusers? Why are we still well, talking about the who's the one that he raped? Uh, th- that doesn't matter. This happened when they were children. Right. Okay? So, like, why don't they bring it up in their 20s? They probably, you know, like. Your 20s were in the 80s, so they weren't really probably right. getting therapy for it. They probably too hopped up on Quaaludes to fix themselves from that trauma. We'll get, you know? it. We'll get to that. Yeah. You know? So, like, and in the 90s, you know, wow, they were they, they found someone, probably were raising children, and now this is all this is coming out. You're like, you know what? I, yes, this is just happened. I'm, you know, they're finally in a state that they can deal with that trauma, and they're, ki- and they're probably empty nesters and don't have to worry about their kids getting the backlash from all this crap. Exactly. You so and, she says, all I know is I can't say. Back and and then I'll throw it to you, but I can't I I can't let this continue without the mask being removed. You know he's trying to get a position of power, right. and she doesn't want her abuser to have more power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it and it's because it's power leave you know it's power leaving the state, so it's like it's a lot of power that this person is going to get. Right. And the other thing with it, like the whole faulty analogy that people are like, well, she drank under law. You know what's that different? The difference is doing something to yourself versus someone else doing something to you. Right. That's the biggest difference. So people bringing alcohol about it, they're like, no, that's a faulty analogy. Yeah, so he he uh, didn't do a lot out of town, uh, around town. He didn't do a lot of socializing. He spent one season coaching girls, at, uh, a girls' softball team that his teenage teenage sister had joined. What? S- said several women who played on the team. He spent time working out at the local YMCA, which we'll get to. And. And that goes back to shows the point of why, like, when you see this type of stuff, you have to get a report. You've got to get it up because this freaking weirdo was teaching freaking girls soccer. Yeah. Or not soccer. Um, softball. Softball. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 it is important for women to get their stories out. Yeah. But there's a lot of re- people. reasons That's people, men gender, and women. Any gender. Because yep. the same thing that happened in the Catholic Church with Absolutely. the little young boys. You're being 100% touched. right. You have to tell your story. Because it, it, biologically, you have to tell your story because what happens is when you don't tell your story of emotional trauma, you keep reliving that cycle of emotional trauma. When you, that first trauma happens to you, you, it happens, it creates grooves in your brain, it packs into the back of your lizard brain, it creates these unconscious patterns. Then have to uh, – Vibbert called right in the middle of my point. <sighs> Vibbert, I don't – I'm – Damn. Yeah. What were you gonna say about Vibbert? You said oh, it before the show. All I gotta say is like it's only a matter of time before Vibbert comes out over at, against your leader about his internship, about <laughs> and, inappropriate yep, touching at work. Yep. At work, inappropriate touching favors. You know. He's a very cute twink. <laughs> so, what happens is that trauma packs into the back of your brain, and you 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 go through a, a cycle of self abuse. The trauma happens. And then you you start punishing, uh, you start isolating yourself. Then you go into s- self pity mode, and then you go into self punishment mode, and then you start pretending everything's normal because your the pressure is so great. And then another trauma happens, and then just keeps compacting, compacting, compacting. Mm-hmm. It's it, it, it not to be indelicate, but the girls that we say have daddy issues, why they make promiscuous choices. It's because something happened to them when they were young or in college, and then they keep reliving that trauma trying to escape it, for example. Um, yeah. you know, And so you have to go through something called cognitive behavioral therapy where you talk it out, you unpack that, you talk about your patterns. You know, My parents' divorce was very traumatic for me, and it created uh, – I won't go into everything that happened because it was just – uh, I don't – you know, my family's alive. I don't want them to deal with the fallout of me saying things publicly. But it created a lot of bad thinking patterns that led to the to the demise of my marriage because my thinking was bad. Hmm. And those three years that I've spent unpacking all of that trauma has been tough, but it's been freeing in knowing why I was making so many of these bad mistakes and just couldn't get it figured out. 
Hmm. You know, and so people need to speak their story. They need to tell a friend. They need to tell a therapist. They need to tell a counselor, and they need to get help. Even if it's 40 years in the past, it still can affect you. If it just happened, you've got to go seek out help. And I completely understand going on my own Facebook page, at, posting about this article, understanding why women and, and men of abuse feel that they won't be heard when they read the reaction of just their friends posting on somebody else's wall going, well, this guy's got a really credible track record and look at how they're talking about uh, Korfman. I don't, I don't want to live that. I don't want to go through that, you know? And so that's what I, that's what I'm saying. You, you really got to think before you hit publish Yeah. what you're putting out into the world, because you don't know that you may be the reason when you hit publish that somebody else is just continuing to live that trauma. And if you are, man, the, the power in numbers and, and the, uh, think about the women who accuse Clinton and the friendship that they've developed, right. uh, because they are in a very unique situation that nobody else understands. Mm -hmm. And when you are open about your trauma, you develop, you find other people like the opening up about my divorce was so powerful for me because I found other people going through divorce and saying, and, and hearing them say, I have this feeling and me going, I do too. And realizing I wasn't a freak. I wasn't alone. I had, I had, a community and belonging and that meaning gave me a second wind and I'm now in a great place in my life because of that that effort and so I just I can't encourage people enough like whatever your trauma is like if you have a drinking problem if you're an alcoholic that is a symptom that is a form of self-destruction mm -hmm. you need to go back to the trauma and yeah. you need to fix that trauma so it, it's it's important to and and whenever somebody is brave enough to put themselves into the Washington fucking post and mm -hmm. detail their story about how they were molested at 14, I've got to go, I'm going to pay attention to that. Yeah. Not immediately write it off. Yeah. No, like with the, um, uh, yeah, the alcoholics out there, alcoholics, alcoholism is a really big to my, because like my dad suffered from that really bad. So um, the, one of the big things you do get at AA meetings is that unpacking of trauma there. Because like, well, what the heck did you do at that meeting? It's unpacking the trauma, finding out why you drank. And finding out that you're not alone. Yeah. N you're not alone in this. You find out like that. Um, it's also, it's kind of neat seeing your different experience going through all this because um, I got to like fix a lot of my trauma while yet I UPY. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first classes I ever failed in my entire life with psychology, and you know, so I had to take it again. And I was still struggling, struggling through the stinking class, but I was able to get cr extra credit for it right. by going to therapy sessions. Mm. So I did that for about a year of going to therapy sessions, getting paid for, for the, you know through my college and stuff like that. But it helped me like talk it out, pa unpack a lot. I went through like a whole bunch of crap that whole year, yeah. which has helped me out. So yeah. it's like the good thing I failed that class. That's why you've been with Lacey for so long. I'm yes. sure. Yeah, going on 14 years. Uh, but, you know, it's just that all that crap that you just got to, like, pack, it, you know, you let you pack on, you go through it. The other thing with this, the you have to understand the crowd, the reason why this was so, uh, you, know, the, you know, they're skeptics of a lot of this stuff because when we get a lot of false accusers out there, yeah. they're not taken to task. And that's another issue with it. Right. They, the, the false accusers, when that stuff happens, they need to be, uh, like, you know, like, Rolling Stone should be sued into oblivion. Um, that mm. one lady, mattress, oh, mattress, yeah, girl. Ma mattress girl, she should also be sued into oblivion. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like anyone that like re still pushing her story should be like a going after defamation. The stupid um, uh, Wamalu fat whale over in UK that accused six guys and had those guys spend a night in jail for accusing them of raping her. She should spend longer in jail than two years, and her name should be like broadcasted everywhere in bars to tell how awful this person was. You probably should have learned her name so you could say it here. <laughs> no, she's freaking... I didn't even think I was going to bring this stupid land whale up. But it's... The problem that, but that that's the big to me that's the biggest problem. It's so hard to like wanting to believe someone because you see a victim in front of you, you feel for them, right? But in the back of your head, it go like, "Grat it, I believe them, I, but I I trust them, but I have to verify their evidence and yeah. where they're coming from." Okay, that's another part of critical thinking because that first your knee jerk reaction is your sympathy. That's an okay reaction to have because this person needs your sympathy. Now yeah. take that. And like try to like now we have to unpack evidence. We have to build a case against this person because, you know, this person needs to be removed. 
their rights need to be removed because if they're doing this to people, they need to be, they need to be removed. Yeah, I'm I sorry. think I think uh, this, this this these people need helicopter rights. Yeah, I think in our discussion in Saturday, it's like it, it it isn't the majority. Like rape culture isn't all men. It is it is a very small fraction of men who are repeat offenders who keep getting away with stuff. And then good men who don't have things that they need to answer for feel like we have to apologize. And so then what you get is the the Trump pendulum swinging to this fake masculinity where, you know, it's actually just really like like Donald Trump in that cycle of self-abuse. I was talking about pretending normal Mm -hmm. like he just lives in that zone, like he just lives in that chaotic, traumatic zone because he cannot get a hold of his own impulses, you know, and that's fake. That's toxic. Like that's the toxic masculinity that you hear about. Like, but every man feels some measure, like we're made to feel some measure of guilt for the, like if you're at a frat party Mm -hmm. and somebody, if you're, if you're at a frat party and there's an incident where somebody is being attacked, I guarantee you that the majority of the guys in that frat are running in to kick that guy's ass. Yeah. You know, it is it is that one guy who is the predator. And uh it it is. It's it, telling your story early means you can you can you can spend less time isolated and abusing yourself and you can keep it from happening to other people. But I know it's so I know it's tough. I mean, it's it's one of those deals where, you know, it, it, we're not psychologically prepared in the middle of tragedy, I mean, especially a 14 year old, you're so confused. Like this, this woman's statement, like, I didn't know what was happening. I, let's continue on in the story yeah, because sorry, yeah. they kind of jump into more details about it. And it just really shows you what a predator this guy is. Because the thing about sexual predators is they find a victim that is uh, lost. Because if somehow the story comes out, then they're, they're less credible. And they're easier to manipulate because they have less uh, a less stable environment where they belong, so it's easier to manipulate them. And that's very true for Korfman, where she even said, you know, I, I have three divorces, and everybody around here knows I work at the payday loan shop. And I'm, tr-, you know, she basically is saying, I feel like white trash. Who's going to believe little old me? He's a Supreme Court justice in the state. Yeah. You know, and that's very intimidating, I'm sure, if you're her. But so... Uh, so just keep that in mind. So six feet tall, well-dressed in slacks and a button-down shirt. Uh, he would always walk around the mall. Korfman describes herself a typical 14-year-old kid of a divorced family. When she first met Moore that day outside in 1979 in the courtroom, she was flattered that a grown man was paying attention to her. He was charming and smiley. After her mother went into the courtroom, Moore asked her where she went to school and what she liked to do and whether he could call her sometime. She remembers giving him her number and says he called not long after. They talked to they talked together when she was in her bedroom and they made plans for him to pick her up on Alcott Road and Riley Street around the corner from her house. Really detailed. That's another sign that this is a credible story. Uh, I was kind of giddy, excited, you know, an older guy, you know, Korfman says, adding that her only sexual experience at that point had been kissing boys her age. She says that it was dark outside and cold when he picked her up, and she thought they were going out to eat. Instead, he drove her to his house, which seemed far, far away. I remember the further I got from my home, the more nervous I got, Korfman says. She remembers an unpaved driveway. She remembers going inside and him giving her alcohol on this visit or the next. Another common marker of sexual predators is that when they get the kid in the house, they give them alcohol. Um, yeah, yeah. look up the documentary on, on, uh, Vimeo called an open secret. Yeah. Uh, or, or just watch catch a predator. Right. <laughs> Brought the four locos. She remembers going inside and him giving her alcohol on this visitor the next. And at some point she told him she was 14. She says they sat and talked and she remembers that Moore told her she was pretty. He put his arm around her and kissed her and that she began to feel nervous and asked him to take her home, which she says he did. Soon after she says he called again and picked her up at the same spot. This was a new experience, and it was exciting and fun and scary, Korfman says, explaining why she went back. It's just like this roller coaster ride you've never been on. That's the thing about young people. They're experiencing life for the first time. That's why a 32-year-old man knows exactly what he's doing, and she doesn't, because she's a child. 
Correct. Yeah, yeah. And don't like. Well, she went back out there. No, she's freaking. If you were sixteen freaking years old, you fourteen. Go, fourteen. Sorry, fourteen. And someone's giving you booze and driving you around in a car. Freshman in high school. You know? Like, how exciting is that? Right. And you're you've got no dad, and you're you know. She says the more drove her back to the same house after dark. He lived in a trailer in the woods, by the way. At that and and that before long, she was lying on a blanket on the floor. She remembers more disappearing into another room and coming out with nothing on but tight white underwear. She remembers that Moore kissed her and that he took off her pants and her shirt and he, that he touched her through her bra and her underpants. She says that he guided her, her hand to his underwear and that she yanked her hand back. I wasn't ready for that. I'd never put my hand on a man's penis, much less an erect one. She remembers thinking, I don't want to do this and I need to get out of here. She says that she got dressed and asked Moore to take her home and that he did. Uh, so... Basically, they go on to say that he would have faced uh, 10 years had he been convicted. She never filed a police report or a civil suit. She says that after their last encounter, Moore called again, but that she found an excuse to avoid seeing him. She says that at some point during or soon after her meetings with Moore, she told two friends in vague terms that she was seeing an older man, bragging to her friends. Yeah. Betsy Davis, who remains friendly with Korfman, now lives in L.A., and she clearly remembers Korfman talking about seeing an older man named Roy Moore when they were teenagers. She says Korfman described an encounter in which an older man wore nothing but tight white underwear. She says she was firm with Korfman that seeing someone as old as Moore was out of bounds. I remember talking to her and telling her it wasn't a good idea because we were so young, Davis says. A, friend, a second friend who spoke on the condition of anonymity for fear of losing her job has a similar memory of a teenage Corfman telling her about seeing an older man. Uh, after talking to her friend, she felt she had done something wrong and kept it secret for years. Another thing that happens a lot, they confide in their close friends, their 14-year-old friends who don't know any better, and right. then they feel bad about it. And, and victims of sexual trauma usually feel that they are the cause of it. They've done something wrong, and they don't want to experience that shame of, of further being told they're wrong. They just want to hunker down and get through it especially at 14 yep uh i felt responsible she says i felt like i had done something bad and it kind of set the course for me doing other things that were bad she says that her teenage life became increasingly reckless with drinking drugs boyfriends and a suicide attempt when she was 16 very common pattern for someone who's been sexually abused as the years went on, Korfman says she did not share her story about Moore, partly because of the trouble in her life. She had three divorces and, and financial problems. While living in Arizona, she and her second husband started screen printing business that fell into debt. They filed for bankruptcy protection three times uh, and didn't pay $139,000 in taxes. Girl, that's fine by me. Uh, in 2005, Korfman paid a fine for driving a boat without lights. In 2010, she was working in a convenience store when she was charged with a misdemeanor for selling a beer to a minor. The charge was dismissed, the records show. So that's the most serious one. And, and every time that uh, Moore wanted to advance the relationship sexually and was told no, he stopped. So... I guess we'll give him brownie points for whatever that's worth, but he's not a rapist, <laughs> right? So it, it it's, but it's still, uh, I mean, it's a chilling account. Like it, when you really get down and read it, you just go, wow. Um, so Gloria Deason said uh, they met when she was eighteen and he was thirty-two. Uh, Mom was really strict, but said uh, I could go out with Roy because he was he was fine. Um, you know the the other ones that they're they're dating stories it's you know he's still 32 dating a 16 year old but there wasn't any kind of sexual I issue there but yeah but like when it's like the mom said it was okay like that's probably just like yes you can hang out with this you know respectable member of the community you know right not go out and date this person right when she was 18 you and know. he was 32 now around the same time that decent says she met more at the jewelry counter wendy moore Wendy Miller says that Moore approached her at the mall where she would spend time with her mom who worked at the photo booth there. Miller says this was in 79 when she was 16. She says that Moore's face was familiar because she had met him two years before when she was dressed as an elf working as Santa's helper at the mall. And she says that Moore told her she looked pretty and that two years later he began asking her out on dates in the presence of her mother at the photo booth. She says she had a boyfriend at the time and declined. Her mother, Martha Brack Brackett, says she refused to grant more permission to date her 16-year-old daughter. I'd say you're too old for her. Let's not rob the cradle, Brackett re recalls. 
Miller, who is now 54, lives in Alabama, says she was flattered by the attention. Now that I've gotten older, she says the idea of a grown man would want to take out a teenager. That was disgusting to me. Oh, yeah. Now, at some point in the post, uh, the post talks about how many people they talk to uh, in this uh, article because they were very clear about making sure that um, that that they talked, they cited thirty sources. They talked to thirty people. It's very detailed. The tight white underwear, the the streets that they were picked up on. Those are good signs. So if you're trying to discern what is a good story and what is not, what is not a good story is the Hannity accuser who can't give you dates and times and just says he he tried to be creepy with me. What is a sign that a story is true is a massive amount of detail. Like these these reporters and the editors of the Washington Post did not do a hatchet job on Roy, Roy Moore. They spent weeks gathering facts and information like investigative journalists. And libertarians and people on this program all the time are sitting there bemoaning what has happened to investigative journalism. Well, this is it. This is what this is investigative journalism of what it looks like. Yeah. Like if if it were a hatchet job, they would have paid some fourteen year old. He raped me when he was fourteen, mm-hmm. and then told some fantastical story. But the fact that they were very clear that he stopped when they said no, like that tells me that like this isn't a hatchet job. You know, this is a credible news source. This is not the Gateway Pundit or Salon trying to make something up. And it's longer than one page. It's, if it was a hatchet job, it would be like this clickbait article that's one page. Right. Uh, so he, uh, he returned to Gasden in 84, went into private law practice. In 85, at 38, he married Kayla, his current wife, who was 24, which I'm not mad. Uh, a few years later, he began to rise in politics. In 92, he became a circuit court judge and hung his wooden Ten Commandments plaque in the courtroom. In 2000, he was elected chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court and soon installed the Ten Commandments in the judicial building. He was dismissed for, from the bench for ignoring a federal court order. Moore was again elected chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court in 12 and again dismissed for ignoring a judicial order instructing probate judges not to issue issue marriage licenses. All of this made Moore a hero to many Alabama voters who considered him a stalwart Christian willing to stand up for their values. In September, Republican primaries uh, for the seat vacated by Jeff Sessions, Moore defeated the appointed sitting Senator Luther Strange, who was backed by Trump and other party leaders in Washington. On a visit on a visit home in the mid '90s to see her mother and stepfather in Alabama, Corfman said she saw Moore's photo in the Gazden Times. Mother, do you remember this guy? Well said, Corfman said at the time. The mother said, the daughter brought it up. That's when Corfman told her. Wells recalled her daughter said that not long after the court hearing in '79, Moore took her to his house. Wells says her daughter conveyed to her that Moore had behaved inappropriately. I was horrified. Wells said. Years later, Korfman said she saw a segment about Moore on Good Morning America and threw up. There were times Korfman said she thought about confronting Moore. At one point during the late 90s, she says she became so angry that she drove to the parking lot outside Moore's office at the county courthouse in Gadsden. She sat there for a while, rehearsing what she might say to him. Remember me, she imagined herself saying. So those are the stories. And I think that uh, so many people, had they actually read the stories and, and exercised critical thinking, would not have read the story thinking, here's a Republican. They would have read the story thinking, this guy's a creep. And this seems legitimate. Not the establishment is trying to rob this guy. Because trust me, no matter how much you think Mitch McConnell is a, uh, an establishment scumbag, he doesn't want a Democrat in the seat. Right. He'd rather have Roy Moore in the seat, I would imagine, mm-hmm. you know, than a well, not, Democrat. And a Republican at Roy Moore, not Roy Moore. Now. <laughs> right, he wants right. a Republican in that seat. Um, so the next day, now here's, I, I don't want to dismiss this woman outright, but I do think that there is a problem with the fifth accuser in that it doesn't exactly fit the template of the other three, but that doesn't necessarily discredit her story. Um, although sitting next to Gloria Allred didn't help. Um, but the thing that's, that sealed it for me was a yearbook, uh, which was really creepy. Have you heard this? Have you heard this yet? 
No, no. Okay. Not the yearbook one. Oh, oh boy. So I was like, hey, go back to Trello. I was like, what? Yearbook? Yeah, so Beverly Nel- Young Nelson, now 55, said that she got to know more, now 70, in the late 1970s when she was a waitress at the Old Hickory House restaurant in northeastern Alabama in Gasden, where Moore lived for much of his life. Nelson said in a news conference that uh, when he was district attorney, he was a regular at the restaurant and would sometimes compliment her looks, touching her long red hair. She showed him a copy of her high school yearbook and that she said Moore signed on December 22nd, 1977 with the inscription, To a sweeter, more beautiful girl, I could not say Merry Christmas. And then uh, signed the location, the Hickory uh, restaurant there. On a cold night, about a week or two after that, Nelson alleges Moore offered to give her a ride home from work after her shift ended at 10 p.m. Now, Moore would come in after work and sit there until close and flirt with her and make suggestive comments. Uh, She was 14 and he was 32. Um, 14. No, no, no. She was 16. I'm sorry. She was 16 years old and he was 32. On a cold night, about a week or two, uh, he offered to give her a ride home after her boyfriend uh, didn't come pick her up. So Moore pulled the two-car door into a dark and deserted uh, area between the dumpster and the back of the restaurant. When she asked what he was doing, Nelson alleges Moore put his hands on her breast and began groping her. When she tried to open the car door and leave, Nelson said, he reached over and locked the door. When she yelled at him to stop and tried to fight him off, she alleges he tightly squeezed the back of her neck and tried to force her head toward his lap. He also tried to pull her shirt off, she said. I was determined that I was not going to allow him to force me to have sex with him. I was terrified. Nelson said at the news conference, uh, I thought he was going to rape me. Uh, he, he said, I can tell you without hesitation, this is absolutely false. I never did what she said. I don't even know the woman. I don't even know anything about her. I don't even know where the restaurant is or was. Uh, that has been his line all along is that this is all fake news and he doesn't know any of these people. He doesn't do any of this. He doesn't know anything. Uh, he's never, you know, and so total opposite of, so, um, then they, then they threw Gloria all right under the bus. Uh, at the news conference in New York, Nelson said that during the incident, she kept fighting with Moore with tears rolling down her face and he eventually stopped. She s- said he then told her, you're just a child and I am the district attorney of Ottawa County. And if you tell anyone about this, nobody's going to believe you anyways. Nelson said she then fell or was pushed out of the car. The passenger door was still open as he burned rubber pulling away, leaving me laying there on the cold concrete in the dark. Said that her neck was black, blue, and purple the next day, and she quit her job at the restaurant so she would not have to see more again. Um, she told her sister what happened. She told her husband, uh, and uh, I guess they verified it. So Nelson got the courage to speak out when the other women spoke out, which is another pattern that happens with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, final final piece of the puzzle here that came out in the New Yorker today. Now, lest you think that the New Yorker is biased. The New Yorker is the one that put out Ronan Farrow's piece on Harvey Weinstein and basically led to the toppling of one of the Clinton's biggest donors. So the New Yorker is uh, obviously a left-leaning publication, but it is, um, you know, fair and balanced, as we all should be when it comes to sexual assault. Uh, This is called – this is titled, Locals Were Troubled by Roy Moore's Interactions with Teen Girls at the Gadsden Mall. And this this author went down there and basically described his time going down to Gadsden and just poking around to see what he could find as a reporter for the New Yorker down in this area. And uh, this this is probably the, the most amazing part of this story. This past weekend, I spoke or messaged with more than a dozen people, including a major political figure in the state who told me that they had heard – over the years, that Moore had been banned from the mall because he repeatedly badgered teenage girls. Some say that they heard at this time, others in the years since. These people include five members of the local legal community, two cops who worked in the town, several people who hung out in the mall in the early 80s, and a number of former mall employees. A request for comment from the Moore campaign was not answered. Several of them asked that I leave their names out of this piece. The stories that they've heard for years have been swirling online in days since the Post published the, its reports. Sources tell me that Moore was actually banned from the Gadsden Mall and the YMCA for his inappropriate behavior of soliciting sex from young girls, the independent Alabama journalist Glenn Wilson wrote on his website on Sunday. Wilson divulged, declined to divulge his sources. 
Uh, so Teresa Jones, a district deputy attorney for Ottawa County in the early 80s, told CNN last week that it was common knowledge that Roy dated high school girls. Jones told me that she couldn't confirm the alleged mall banning, but said it's a rumor I've heard for years. Uh, and if you want to read the rest of that piece, you can uh, do so at your leisure. It's a good piece. Um, so these these are the facts. These, these are the the facts backed up by the ability of Roy Moore to sue the Washington Post for slander and defamation. Uh, and or is it libel? One of the two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lawyer. But. It, they 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 put, they put their uh, journalistic integrity for whatever you may think that's worth. Now here's the deal: you can hear all of this stuff, and you can hear all of these things, and you can you can determine what you think is true or not. You can you can choose to believe these accusers, or you can choose to believe more, or you can think that the truth is somewhere in the middle, or. or, or you can find none of this credible as Senator Pat Toomey, or you can find it all very compelling at, like uh, Senator uh, Mitch McConnell. Uh, you know, obviously John McCain's not down with Roy Moore. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you've now heard the facts, and you've got to make up your own decision what you think is the truth here. Um, I personally read these accounts – and found the, these to be credible stories from news sources that I think, yes, are biased towards power. Yes, are biased towards the left, but overall more reliable than a blog. <laughs> uh, more reliable than a YouTube channel where someone sits in their basement. Wait, I should stop talking before we uh, lose our credibility. Uh, <laughs> I, I found this to be very truthful. Um, I don't have a political – I have a bias against Roy Moore, but it's not a bias that is passionate because I don't live in that state, and I wouldn't vote for him anyways. He's not a libertarian, so I'm not trying to defend him. Like there's there's really no reason for me to be concerned with this other than I think that this is a very important time for choosing for libertarians. I think that we as libertarians have to look at it and – uh we have to find the middle ground between winning and doing things that win and doing things that build an audience and doing things that convince people that libertarianism is the best way for us to win, but while doing it so that we don't sacrifice our soul. So many of us have left our political parties because we didn't want to vote for the lesser of two evils. We didn't want to participate in a system of evil. We didn't want to participate in a system that had broken moral leadership. And Roy Moore is the very definition of broken moral leadership. And I know this stuff happened 40 years ago, and maybe he is a changed man. And I believe in the power of redemption and the power of changing your life for the better. But that doesn't necessarily qualify you for leadership in the public square. And if Roy Moore were standing up saying, yes, I did these things, and much like Louis C.K., I think Louis C.K. showed much more leadership than Roy Moore is showing. Because it's clear Roy Moore, Moore dated 16-year-old girls, and just saying this isn't true and this is all fake news when like 100 people are saying, yeah, that's true, means he's lying. He's a liar. Whereas Louis C.K., everybody in the community, much like in Alabama, how everybody knew about the teenage girls, nobody said anything. Everybody in the comedy community knew what Louis C.K. had been up to. Whether he had been up to it lately, he had done that stuff in the past. One of the women in the article I have professional interactions with. I don't like her. But part of the reason I don't like her is that she's – very direct and tells the truth and is open and like I hate the term bitch but she's kind of a bitch <laughs> like and she was she's been very rude to me on occasion but that makes me think that like when I read it I was like well if she's the source she's not lying because she's not a liar she's a bitch but she's not a liar and then he came out and said yeah I was wrong and uh I, you know I think we have to choose what kind of leadership we want in media, in politics, in our families, in our life, in our friends, in our – like there was a study that came out that you, you literally, neurologically, 
are made up of your friends. Like your friends and their brave their brain waves impact your brain waves. Hmm. Like that's how important it is for you to choose the right friends. It's how important it is for you to choose the right mate. It's how important it is for you to choose the right things to put in your brain. Like I hated Wolf on Wall Street because it was poison for my soul. Like I got done watching Wolf of Wall Street and I regretted watching it because it was toxic to my soul. Like I hated it. You know, and I think you have to really think about the choices that you're making on a daily effort because to change society for the better, we have to make individual changes within ourselves, within our community, and hope that over time we reverse the trend that we're heading towards. And yes, I know Donald Trump is seductive, and I know that uh, Roy Moore is seductive to libertarians because they're anti-power, but they're also complete moral corruption. Yeah. They're the end result of choosing the lesser of two evils. Pretty much, yeah. So, I mean, go ahead, Harry. Oh, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just gonna say again, it's pretty much. I, I get sick and tired of the people who like give crap and it's like, well, this is who we, you know, you know, they got to choose. But I thought there was a libertarian that's in that race that's going against it. I don't think so. I thought, I thought, I thought they, uh, no, okay, they probably didn't. But that's all it comes down to. Oh like, yeah, there yeah, is I a thought, libertarian. I, I think. thought there was. Yeah. Um, let me because i remember that meme where it's like the exes and like they're basically saying you know this guy never raped anybody it's like okay yeah I don't know, it's kind of kind of rude to put the democrat as a question mark i didn't like that meme um i do want to read you louis ck's statement because uh i thought it was really uh like he owned up to it part of it is a little bit um I don't know. It, it's a it's a different owning up to, and it's different and set apart to me than more than anything else. Than anything else. I'm yeah. Saying. So, uh, I want to address the stories told in the New York Times by the five women named Abby, Rebecca, Dana, Julia, who felt able to name themselves and the one who did not. These stories are true. At the time, I said, "Now, if you don't know, Louis C.K. basically would ask women if he could beat off in front of them, and uh, the the comedy troupe that said." Uh, n- n- like, no, he just went ahead and got naked and did it anyways. <laughs> and he kept trying to beat off in front of women and, like, on the phone beating off with them and, like, uh, just really weird, bizarre behavior. Like, he wasn't hurting anybody, but also I think he kind of admits that he was. And I think you'll hear, like, the the, the argument that I hear from anarchists and libertarians is, like, well, there wasn't physical assault. And, yeah, like, Legally, you're right. Louis C.K. shouldn't go to prison for beating off in front of somebody. You know, he didn't kidnap them. They had the the ability and the choice to get up and leave, but he didn't do the right moral thing. And so often libertarians are so quick to argue, like, what is the what is the legal aspect here that they end up looking like uh, libertines instead of libertarians? Yeah. You know, like, oh, uh, well, how if I paid for the 14-year-old girl and she consents to it, then I guess in, in Kapistan it's fine. Like, no, it's not. Because she doesn't have, she's 14, you anarchist jerk. But I paid for it. <laughs> Harry's joking. Yeah. Uh, for 40 years from now, when that clip gets played, I know, he's I know, joking. I know, right? Um, the stories are true. At the same time, I said to myself that what I did was okay. Because I never showed a woman my dick without asking first, which is also true. But what I learned later in life, too late, is that when you have power over another person, asking them to look at your dick isn't a question. It's a predicament for them. The power I had over these women is that they admired me, and I wielded that power irresponsibly. Now, if, if that sounds like arrog- arrogant, it's that they said in the article, like, we admired Louis. Like, we, we thought we were going to get advice on how to be famous comedians, and then he got naked and beat off in front of us. And then we wouldn't even try to get jobs when his agent was attached to any kind of – we would just re- withdraw our submission. So – and I just thought, man, this is such a great line. When you have power over another person, asking them to look at your dick isn't a question. It's a predicament for them. The power I had over these women is that they admired me, and I wielded that power irresponsibly. I've been remorseful of my actions, and I've tried to learn from them and run from them. Now I'm aware of the extent of the impact of my actions. 
I learned yesterday to the extent to which I left these women who admired me feeling badly about themselves and cautious around other men who would never put them in that position, which is such a key point. Like, so many men get so tired of having to answer for the broken patterns of fucked up guys. Right, yeah. We don't have to defend these losers. Right. Like, they they change their behavior because of one bad dude, which the good guys down the line had to pay for. Right. And it, and that that is an unfair thing for these abusers to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I took advantage of the fact that I was widely admired in my community and their community, which disabled them from sharing their story and brought hardship to them when they tried because people who, who look up to me didn't want to hear it. I didn't think that I was doing any of that because my position allowed me not to think about it. There's nothing about this that I forgive myself for, and I have to reconcile it with who I am which is nothing compared to the task I left with them. I wish I had reacted to their admiration of me by being a good example to them as a man and given them some guidance as a comedian, including because I admired their work. The hardest regret to live with is what you've done to hurt somebody else, and I can hardly wrap my head around the scope of hurt I brought on them. I'd be remiss to exclude the hurt I brought on the people who I work with and have worked with whose professional and personal lives have been impacted by all of this including all of his productions, which he lists, which I was kind of like, that's a nice plug. I deeply regret that this has brought negative attention to my manager, Dave Becky. Uh, I I am sorry for all the people that supported me. I've brought pain to my family, my friends, my children, and their mother, and I've spent my long and lucky career talking and saying anything I want. I will now take a a step back and take a long time to listen. Thank you for reading. So I thought that was a, a, a nice note of contrition where he really understands what he did wrong. Yeah. And that's what that's the problem with Harvey Weinstein is that he used his power in a, in a way that he got sexual favors and some of it was consensual and some of it was not. And even putting a woman in the predicament where she makes the choice isn't right. Is it legal? That the sex was consensual, yes, but it's still a predicament, and that's where, to me, it's morally wrong. Should he go? Should Harvey Weinstein go to prison? No, unless he legitimately did rape a couple of the women who said that he forced himself on them. But like, should Louis C.K. go to jail? No. Should the force of the state be used against them? No. Should Roy Moore go to if the statute of limitations applied? Should Roy Moore go to jail? Yes, because he put his hands on a fourteen-year-old child. You know, and we're, we're, we're getting lost with this flat thinking of just like uh, uh, of remembering the line, which is you don't touch other people. Other people are not your property. And so do not try and hurt them and take their stuff mm-hmm. or defraud them. Yeah. But the other thing with it is um, the waters with sex have so been muddied. Yeah. Is, it's, is it a, in, especially in libertarian space, uh, because of when it comes to the prostitution, you have the ability, uh, we, most libertarians, majority of them, will believe that you do own your body and you can sell it. Right. And generally, we when we think about that, it is comes to prostitutes and strippers and um, escorts and all that different stuff, right? Right. To me, the, the argument that I like to have with this wing, it's like, it's the same, it's part of it, it can't. You know, someone decided to put this thing, which society sees as a taboo, on the negotiation table. Yeah. I want to put this on the table. You know, hey, I got a seven-figure job here. I'm going to have to beat off into this plant. <laughs> and you're going to have to watch. Right. You know, uh, you know, or, you know, you're going to have to get on the knees. You know, it's – is it wrong? Heck, yeah. That's You know, but at the, at the same time, it's like – yeah, but if he bought a prostitute and paid her to do that, I wouldn't think that's wrong too. Right. I, w- I wouldn't think that's wrong. That's a, that's that's where I'm coming from, and that's where I question the whole thing. It's because it's your body. Can you put you know unless someone like lock, lock. now the other one with the Harvey Weinstein? I'm not going to forgive that. That some of that it was you know like locking the door, persuading him to come back in. Yeah, yeah, it was putting him back in, you, you, force him into a closet. Right. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. Yeah, I you don't get have that a, out there in front. You just you don't you don't have to touch somebody to kidnap them, and that is well, that is a violation of the non-aggression principle. Yeah, but I'm more of talking about like you know like kind of like you know 
let's go with the movie the producers right I, I like to bring that movie up you know you know some you know old broad wants to who's opp um another terrence pop joke i've got i hope terrence pop and my emails back to come back on this show to come on the show <laughs> i want terrence pop on the show so bad um the uh OPP is old, poor, and powerless. Uh, going after some of these OPP broads, not hit, uh, you know, pound and smashing them, getting the cash to run films, right? Mm-hmm. You know, he's technically get, you know, he's basically prostituting himself out, you know, but using sex as part of the deal to get money for these different things, right? You know, it's putting that on the table. Most people see that as a taboo that should not go on the negotiating table. But hey, you know, we believe that you own your own body. You can put anything on your table as long as you're not enslaving yourselves. Yeah. You know, so that's where I feel that's where I start questioning that. Mm-hmm. That's that's where my question starts. I do. I stop the moment when it does become kidnapping and forcing. That's where I stop. Right. Yeah. But yeah, that's where I'm at. on that. I think I think it's a function of the libertarian being the libertarian movement being so INTJ engineer accountant. ENTJ, you know, thank you. So ENTJ like and the ENFJ in me is so hellbent on making this movement understand the 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 intangibles the grays that not everything is black and white the complexities of human emotion and thought go into some of this you you it, it not not only that yes there are laws and laws are it's not good enough to just repeal laws and have these anarchist, minarchist discussions about what laws we will accept and how those laws will be ordered. We are missing a whole other part of the discussion, which is that you have to be good moral agents to have a libertarian society. Yeah. And I'm not going to be try and be a preacher. I'm not going to force my religion on anybody, but I think I, I really want it, it, at my time on Earth, for as long as this show exists— For people to understand that for a libertarian society exists, we as individuals have to understand our individual duty in building a moral society. And you cannot legislate morality. You can only make individual choices. Mm -hmm. And the libertarian movement has gone so far away from the idea of individuality and the responsibilities that go along with that and so far into crafting the policy of a libertarian future – that they've forgotten that our people as a society are not prepared for it morally. Right. And you don't have to be a religious person to have good morals. I know a lot of atheists who are really good people. A lot of times they are more moral people than Christians, a.k.a. Roy Moore. Like, But yeah. it comes down to how you treat individuals, the individual interpersonal communications and and ways that we treat people on a one-on-one basis, those extend beyond us into the spontaneous order of society. And if we're ever going to have a libertarian future, we have to start making good choices. And good choices include not even remotely touching support for a man like Roy Moore. And I don't know how we as a society feel like it's, like how did pedophilia, how did child molestation, not pedophilia, how did child molestation become the new third rail of American politics? Like, how did we let ourselves get there? And it's because we've stopped taking responsibility for ourselves and our actions and our family and our community, and we've started assigning it to the government, the blacks, the whites, the SJWs, the Jews, the, the Nazis. We have a, we, even, even people who believe in the libertarianism are assigning their responsibility well i'd just be a libertarian if it weren't for the government no you are a libertarian start living like it and that includes treating people with respect yeah so it's it, it just it's i think the reason i'm so amped up about this roy moore situation is that it has so many troubling signs in it that we as a society that during bill clinton's time you had Juanita Broderick and Tawana – was it not Tawana Brawley, but you had – the list. <laughs> you, 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 you had the list of the Clinton accusers, and the religious right coming out of the 80s set the Republican Party up to be the, the moral center, and that was the new home of morality for, for anybody who was a, a, a moral – a Christian conservative – you existed in the Republican Party. You, you, the moral center was there, 
And, you know, now we're at a point where it's, it's, well, if they do it, we can do it too. Like to me, that's such a, a, a yeah, the, the, I forget what Ben Shapiro calls it, but, but the, what, you know, it's like a really quick, easy term, but like that grade school logic of they did it so we can do it too. Yeah. Like, the Republican Party, I'm sorry, you guys have a a soul problem now. Like you are no longer the moral center of of this country as a as a political party. And I'm glad because I'm tired of pol- politicians trying to be moral. They're not. Oh, yeah, they yeah. they're professional thieves. Yeah. Like the you are you are for the price of political victory going to put somebody who be- is defending his actions in touching a 14 year old by not owning up to it when it's clear he did it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if yeah. you, if you felt like it was a clear cut case or not. Uh, I don't know. I-, I didn't ask you like after hearing the whole story and all these details, like where do you come down on the Roy Moore thing? Or if you can answer that after you were going to make the points that you're about to make about the moral center. With uh, Roy Moore, to me, it's um, there's a lot of smoke to that, and it really looked like he has to look that. It would, I'm sorry, like this. There's something to there. There's something that needs to be investigated, and and just was like, well, that's 40 years ago. He could have changed. We don't know that. There yeah. could be, you know, like 20 somethings, you know, 20 years ago. There just could be a high schooler that can come out with a story. And I, other things, or you know, who knows? He could have flipped then, and we started realizing re- there could be a reason why it stops in '79 because you know he started dropping bodies in the '80s. We don't know that either. Yeah. Now that's speculation. I'm speculating. Now listen, I, I don't. But I, the, I, I, I. But I, the other thing. Oh, sorry. I've I've worked in media, politics, racing. I've spent my entire career around rich, powerful men, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't. I don't try to pull the expert expert card too often. Yeah. But like when it comes to knowing what is and what is not real, when it comes to rich, powerful men behaving badly, I know better than most people that are commenting on my Facebook feed. And like, th- this is a case of a rich, powerful man behaving badly. And I've met Subway Jared like four times. Like Subway Jared was like one of the nicest guys I've ever met. You would never suspect that that dude had a hard drive full of child porn. Mm. Or that he was going off to wherever to, you know, touch kids. Like, you don't, you don't know what's on this guy's hard drive right now. Like, and and it just shows a uh, a moral corruption at an age when, like, listen, I I wouldn't say I've been a scumbag, but I'm not always been a good person. But I'm always trying to progress towards being a better person, and that really started when I hit thirty. And I just don't want to be. I don't know people who hit thirty and are like not trying to get better, like and are good people at at seventy. Who knows? Uh, the one thing with uh, um, um, libertarians also, some reason, like you've came to this other third choice, this other option of thing, and yet sometimes they um, humans has the problems of just falling back in that black and white thinking that you think of. Yep. But you have to understand, you know, just. Just the same way that you got to that critical thinking step to not keep choosing the lesser two evils, you have to understand there's more than a right and a wrong answer to this. It's not right. It's not one. It's not zero. There's many shades of gray on this sucker yeah. here that you can you know you can pick and pick pick and choose from. They can all and at the, at the same time, just like I um just like the main reason why Spangle is so okay with the crazy cast of characters, the Wheel Libertarians who have all of has their own different small paths to live. Liberty. Even though it's like, how can like Chris as a libertarian and vote can hang out with anarchists? Because we all believe that there is multiple paths, and multiple answers to liberty, and there can be multiple answers. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, there can be multiple right answers. It's like there's multiple wrong answers. I was born into chaos. I'm okay with it. I don't like order. <laughs> I want. I want to be challenged. Like I want to be challenged, and I want. I want an audience of people that want to be challenged too, because those become the new moral center. Those yeah. become the people that. If you're willing to open up your beliefs to testing, mm-hmm. then you are going to end up with stronger morals, stronger values, stronger beliefs in in every area of your life, you know. And I go to therapy once a month now to be tested, yeah. to say like this is what I'm thinking. Like I I genuinely have spent about the last month thinking all my friends hate me, and like is that a rational thought? No. Like what's the social proof? 
They like you. They may just be tired of your ass, <laughs> but... Do get tired of you. Oh, I know. Spangle fatigue's a real thing. Uh, this audience knows it. You know it. I know it. You're better on Discord, though. Uh, I just pop in. It's so much better on Discord. It's awesome. Everybody check it out at WeirdLibertarians.com. <laughs> so, final thoughts on all the Roy Moore stuff before we move to WikiLeaks. Would I have time for that? Yeah. Fuck it. We've already hit two hours, man. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, final thoughts on Roy Moore. Um... <sighs> When it comes to um, to my personal uh, thing, when I see someone coming out against someone for sexual harassment or rape cases years ahead, if they're in their 20s or 30s and they come out 20 years later, you know, I'm completely skeptical skeptical of their position. But as kids, no, no. To me, it's 19 and younger. That's that point in someone's life that they're just trying to figure out everything is going on. And to me, that seems like at the age of someone would hold something inside and not really become okay without letting that out into the public 20 years later. Yeah. But a 30 year old something, some about something, a 28 something, and they're waiting a few years to come up that, eh, yeah. you know, I'm kind of, you know, I'm skeptical of why they would bring it out at yeah. any time. And I don't care. It's like, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's, there, 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 you know, there's safety in the group. Yeah. But, you know, come on. You were like 28 when that happened. Come on. You know, yeah. You you knew you could. He's like, what? You didn't know you could call the cops. What? You didn't know that. You couldn't call them. Well, he was a district attorney. He probably thought he could get away with it, even if they did. Yeah, but but he didn't go after a twenty eight year old. There's a reason why he preyed on people who right. didn't think, who thought, you know, basically, I'm the law, and thought he was, and thought, you know, yeah. You know. And the thing is, it's the seventies in the back roads of Alabama. He probably could have got rid of something. That's why there's probably small stories of it. There's a prop. <laughs> You know, I'm specula- and speculating and allegedly that, that, you know, who knows? Crazy stuff happens in backwoods areas, especially in the South. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, that's how Bittner got around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been in several different communities over the course of my career. Local politics here in Indiana. Uh, racing, c- comedy, radio libertarianism um and i can tell you that in every movement there are always stories about things uh harry's gonna go tinkle i think is that what you're all right i wasn't all right all right i didn't know what the hand signals were for i'm not black i don't understand gang signs (laughs) right um i've been a part of all these different communities and in every community there's always did you hear you know and i could name Hoosier politicians right now that I know cheat on their wives, and I've got proof. I know, well, I don't have proof. I know people who have proof. But, like, what am I going to do about it? What, what acts do I have to grind? Like, what, why is it my responsibility to ruin their life or career? You know, like, every community, every office, every place has all these. That's, you know, that's why this stuff doesn't come out for 40 years. Because it it just people don't say anything. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want chaos. They want order because that's what they're comfortable with. And so every time somebody is willing to stand up and say, hey, this isn't right, uh, I don't think we should automatically dismiss them. I think we should listen to them, evaluate the evidence, and then judge it appropriately and have an appropriate response. So uh, let's move on to uh, our, our next story two hours later. Um I feel like that was – I had a lot to get off my chest, man. I, I thank you for, for uh, sticking with us, and hopefully you you uh, hear my words with uh, – just listen to me. Just do what I say. <laughs> All right. Jeez. Uh, WikiLeaks and Donald Trump Jr. So this broke on the Atlantic last night, and uh, Wolf Blitzer's little pink nipples couldn't have been harder. As it was coming through, he was screaming in his monotone voice – and we now have new evidence of a link between Russia and WikiLeaks. And uh, again, as all of these stories, like I, I remember, <laughs> I, I heard it on CNN. I watched it. I watched an hour of CNN last night, and I just remember thinking, "Man, Donald Trump Jr. and Donald Trump are hosed." And then I read the story today, and. I they aren't hosed <laughs> like and you it's just amazing how this it really uh it really is amazing how if you don't watch CNN and you read the articles you get the news um 
All right. So, oh, Rick Irvine has a great Little Pink Houses by Milton Mil- Mil- I should write Little Pink Nipples about Wolf Blitzer and do a song parody. Anybody has any musical talent, help. So, uh, it's your joke. November 13th, <laughs> The Atlantic, a, uh, a publication I really like. And they've got a writer named Connor Friesendorf, who's very libertarian leaning, uh, who's an amazing writer. I love Connor, Connor's writing. The Atlantic is worth a click every day to check out and see what they're doing. Uh, as with anything, you know, establishment leaning, left leaning, um, but it, it stuff that makes you think. It's not like Salon.com. So definitely worth a look. Um, the Secret Correspondent Between Donald Trump Jr. and WikiLeaks uh, by Julia Ioff. Just before the stroke of midnight on September 20th, 2016, at the height of the last year's presidential elections, the WikiLeaks Twitter account sent a private DM to Donald Trump Jr., the Republican nominee's oldest son and campaign surrogate. Now, there's a question here that never gets answered in the story. They never say where they got this information from. They never tell you how what the source of the information is. Now, obviously, Julian Assange says that this stuff did happen, uh, and I think Donald Trump Jr. did as well. But um, it, it it is interesting that there's this information. What I think happened, and they kind of allude to it in the story, is that somebody at one of the intelligence committees or, like, Donald Trump Jr. submitted his Twitter to be, uh, you know, cataloged for one of these investigative committees, and it was leaked from one of those committees. So this is this is a political hit job. Yeah, boys and girls, this is a political hit job by somebody in the Democratic side of one of these committees getting looking for finding and releasing some damning evidence. So this is what a hit job looks like. Um, And it's all about the headline. It is the secret correspondence between Donald Trump Jr. and WikiLeaks, which is tied to Russia, you know, and there's not a lot of smoke here, but let's get into it. A pack run anti uh, WikiLeaks wrote to Donald Trump Jr., A PAC-run anti-Trump site, PutinTrump.org, is about to launch. The PAC is a recycled pro-Iraq war PAC. We guessed the password. It is Putin Trump. All lowercase, Harry. All one word, Putin Trump. That's the password. Convenient. See about for who is behind it. Any comments? And they asked Donald Trump Jr. for comments. Twelve hours later, he responds, Off the record, I don't know who that is, but I'll ask around. Thanks. Now, Harry, mm-hmm. if I send you, if you're if you're uh, it's twenty years from now and you're the biggest thing in uh, tech and gaming reporting okay. on on the Wall Network, and you have uh, two million Twitter followers, mm-hmm. if t- Twitter makes it past the next year, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I send you a note with some juicy information, and you uh, let's let's switch it. Uh, I you send me some juicy information and you get excited about it. And then I reply, off the record, I don't know who that is, but I'll ask around. Thanks. How do you take that? Suspicious. He blew me off. Yeah, he blew me off. He blew me off. Wonder what else he knows. Right. Well, either you know something or know this is bad or he's just, you know, being a dick. Right. Uh, the messages obtained by The Atlantic were also turned over by Trump Jr.'s lawyers to congressional investigators. They are part of a long and largely one-sided correspondence between WikiLeaks and the president's son that continued until at least July 2017. Um, and then let's see here. So they make a bunch of increasingly bold requests. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the Trump's lawyer said they turned it over. Um, the messages were turned over to Congress, uh, part of the ongoing investigations. Uh, though Trump gen- mostly ignored the frequent messages from WikiLeaks, he at times appears to have acted on its requests. When WikiLeaks first reached out to Trump Jr. about PutinTrump.org, he followed up with his promise to ask around. According to a source familiar with congressional investigations <clears throat> into Russian interference with the 2016 campaign, who requested anonymity, of course, because the investigation is ongoing on the same day that Trump Jr. received the first message. He emailed uh, Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, Brad Parcell, and Jared Kushner, telling them WikiLeaks had made contact. Kushner then forwarded the email to the communication staff at Hope Hicks. Uh, At no point during the 10-month correspondence does Trump Jr. rebuff WikiLeaks, which had published stolen documents. So... The left and the Atlantic are like, 
Well, they had published stolen documents, and Donald Trump Jr. didn't yell at them. He didn't get in when they slid into his DMs. He didn't chastise them. Like, why is he's a busy guy? Yeah, he's running a multi-billion organization. He's working for a campaign. He's not going to take the time to climb on his little high horse like one of these little SJW Twitter trolls and write them a strongly worded note. 140 characters. <laughs> it, it just it just shows you that the left doesn't have a concept of like what busy successful people do on a daily basis they have no idea right. they think they just sit there on their yacht like scrooge mcduck scrooge mcduck it <laughs> right you know they're not calling people getting getting heads up about what different things are going on looks like to me it's like it seems like a lot of people have never been in the same room as someone who has been rich and successful exactly i know because they're so freaking busy october 3rd 2016 wikileaks wrote again hiya which is a weird way hiya it'd be great if you guys could comment on or push this story uh from Hillary Clinton wanting to drone Julian Assange. Trump Jr. responded, already did that today. It was amazing. It's amazing what she can get away with. Again, kind of a, uh, yeah, thanks for writing. I'm uh, I'm interested, but I'm busy, so blah, 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 blah. Yep. Two, mi- two minutes later, Trump wrote back, what's behind this Wednesday leak I keep reading about? The day before, Roger Stone, an informal advisor to Trump, said, Wednesday, Hillary Clinton is done, hashtag WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks didn't respond to the message. But on October 12th, the account again messaged Trump Jr. Hey, Donald, great to see you and your dad talking about our publications. Uh, when Trump, the day before at a rally, two days before, had said, I love WikiLeaks, when they uh, released a batch of emails. S- uh, strongly suggest your dad tweets this link if he mentions us. Uh, there's many great stories the press are missing, and we're sure some of your followers will find it. By the way, we just released Podesta emails number four. Trump didn't respond to this message, but two days later tweeted about the uh, search site that they had set up for these. Um, On October 21st, they write, Hey, Don, we have an unusual idea. Leak us one or more of your father's tax returns. And then they laid out why it would benefit them. Uh, They basically would release it. (laughs) This is kind of funny. Um... The rest could come out anytime through the most biased sources. Example, New York Times, MSNBC. It is the third reason that WikiLeaks wrote that is the real kicker. If we publish them, it will dramatically improve the perception of WikiLeaks impartiality, they explain, exclaim, explained. That means that the vast amount of stuff that we are pushing on Clinton will have much higher impact because it won't be perceived as coming from a pro-Trump, pro-Russia source. It then provided an email address and a link where the Trump campaign could send the tax returns and the same for any other negative stuff that you think has a decent chance of coming out. Let us put it out. Trump didn't respond to the message. They didn't write again till Election Day, November 8th. Hi, Don. If your father, quote unquote, loses, we think it is much more interesting is if he does not concede and spends time challenging the media and other types of rigging uh, uh, that occurred and as he has implied that he might do. Um... The discussion can be transformative as it exposes media corruption and primary corruption and PAC corruption. Uh, Then when he won, they just wrote, wow. Uh, (laughs) Trump Jr. didn't respond to any of these messages. Too busy winning. Right. Hi, Don. Hope you're doing well. Uh, In relation to Mr. Assange, Obama, after on December 16th, Obama Clinton placed pressure on Sweden, UK, and Australia, his home country, to illicitly go after Mr. Assange. It would be real easy and helpful for your dad to suggest that Australia appoint Assange ambassador to DC. That's a, you know, that's a real smart, tough guy you've got, and the most famous Australian or something similar. They won't do it, but it will send the right signals to Australia, UK, and Sweden to start following the law and stop bending it to ingratiate themselves with the Clintons. So. Uh, after all the Russian meeting came out, WikiLeaks wrote them, Hi, Don. Sorry to hear about your problems. We have an idea that may help a little. We are very interested in confidentially attaining, obtaining and publishing a copy of the email cited in the Times today. We think it is strongly in your interest. Don Jr. did not reply to any of those. Now, Julian Assange uh, came out and insisted that his organization was merely attempting to solicit leaks. WikiLeaks appears to beguile some, he says, some people into transparency by convincing them that it is in their interest, he said on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was intended to generate a transformative discussion on the corrupt media, PACs, and primary corruption if they could get him to deny that Clinton won the election. So 
Now, listen. Which John Jr. is probably like, this is not the first, his first rodeo of someone trying to pump him for information. Exactly. The dude is a walking cash register to most of the world and yeah. most of the people in his world. His entire life, yes. he was a walking cash register. And so here's what you have. You have a, journal, a, a, a group of journalists, I'm going to call WikiLeaks journalists, uh, doing exactly what journalists hackers. do. I call them hackers. They're heroes. Well, in the way that they publish the information, they definitely sort it and distribute it in the way that a journalist would. Yeah. Um, so there's the hackers. But ha- they're heroes most of the time, so they're hackers. Exactly. Too. All right. Not not crackers. No, not crackers. Right. Crackers are malicious. So what, what you do if you are a media outlet, if you are a digital media outlet, if you're a traditional newspaper, you work your sources, you reach out to a bunch of different sources, you send them things that might be of interest to them because you're trying to get your stuff on their radar so they can share it so you can build and generate interest. The Indianapolis Star does this. I do this. Your local talk radio station does this. Mm-hmm. We all reach out to influencers within a space we send them a link and we say, "Hey, I did this thing. I would, I think you might be interested in this." This is basic PR tactics that the Atlantic turns into some sort of nefarious tie. Donald Trump Jr. is a busy man who didn't reply at one point. Ask them, "Hey, what's this thing that Roger Stone's talking about?" Didn't have clearly. It shows he didn't talk to Roger Stone about what he knew. Mm-hmm. So Don Jr. must be telling the truth that when he says, "I don't know what Don, what." what Stone was talking about. He didn't because he was asking WikiLeaks. Why ask the question if you didn't know the information? So again, we have these people reaching out to the Trump campaign and the Trump campaign largely ignoring them. And this is the pattern with the Trump campaign. Again, it goes back to patterns. You have to look at the patterns of things. The Russians keep trying to infiltrate the campaign. They get nowhere with the campaign. WikiLeaks tries to get sources and information and leaks they get nowhere. What you are seeing is not corruption on the Republican presidential campaign side. What you are seeing is how campaigns and media and journalism really work. And so if you're bothered by any of it, know that this is how it works at the highest levels of politics. Mm -hmm. And this is how it works at the highest levels of media. And it is not some nefarious thing. This is how it works. Now, if you don't like how it's working, then then you can be outraged. But it, it is intellectually dishonest for the left to claim that only the the Trump campaign did this stuff. Because I guarantee they were sliding in Hill's DMs. Oh, yeah. They were sliding in John Podesta's DMs. They were sliding in everybody's DMs. Because that's what WikiLeaks apparently does to try and generate interest. Well, yeah, that's how you you know you get things from people. You think uh, it's too hard to try to hack into every you know like freaking server and pull information out. It's a lot easier just to ask for it. A lot of the time, hey, if you ask nice enough or give enough stuff, most people will you know like want to know what else you know and give information back. It's part of social engineering, people. Yep. You know, it's a it's a brilliant tactic. The the one of the investigative reporters from the local ABC affiliate, uh, Channel Six. She would email me once a month. Hmm. Hey, you got any stories? I never had. I the one few times I had stories, she she didn't really follow up on it. But she did reach out once a month and say, "Hey, anything going on that I should look into?" You know. And mm-hmm. when I had stuff, I'd pass it on to her. Mm-hmm. And I have to assume that she was not contacting just the Libertarian Party of Indiana executive director. Nope. She probably was contacting three or four hundred people. Yeah. In that's the a, same way. That's a bot waiting for something to hit back. Right. So. Sweet, some hit back. Someone's got something. Someone's got something. You know? it, it, yeah. And it, it just pains me again. And, and then they just like, well, so what? What is WikiLeaks? It's just an organization about somebody who's, you know, it, that's, that, that publishes, you know, stolen documents. Yeah. It's no one's friend. Right. No government's friend. They screwed, they've already screwed up the United States government. They screwed over the, the you know, any government they can get a, a piece of their document, they will publish it. Right. So it's not like it's, you know, it's, oh, it's Russia, or Russia's working through WikiLeaks. Eh, that's, you know, come on. Come on. It's crap. Do do we like WikiLeaks, Harry? What do, what, what, what is your opinion of WikiLeaks? I think it's, it's a different, it's different. It's different. It's not the same thing anymore. Um, well, explain that. Uh, um, oh, man. All right, um. I just feel that a lot of the time that 
Now, this is just a feeling, just a hunch. Um, I really got a, I had a feeling about this, and I got a really bad feeling about it, too, when I was listening to another podcast, and, and um, Brian Sovereign of Sovereign Tech Podcast, and he kind of, like, confirmed my own bias when he was talking about this, too. Yeah. I'm like, a oh, crap, you know, like. Sovereign Tech. Yeah, yeah, Sovereign Tech. I love his podcast. It's one of the main tech podcasts I listen to every week, but it's. I was listening to it and it was confirming my confirming my bias on the aspect that I think that there's like maybe a government agent inside you know WikiLeaks or the or the or some government or some state actor you know has control of them and they basically use it to release different things out to the public hmm. to release things that they want to get rid of and they don't want to do it through any other official channels. American, Russian, state, French, state. It doesn't matter. They're all the same thing. Okay, so you're saying the 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 deep state of the international order, yeah, the Rothschilds, yeah, to release things or just to like to me. Do you think David Rockefeller has control of the Twitter account? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't think he controls the Twiz Twitter. He's account. dead now, but yeah. But uh, the main thing what I see is that it's almost like a, I don't know. This is my own feelings. Like it's almost like kind of like Cohen. You put your hat, your your tinfoil hats on now. 3D glasses, please. Uh, this COINTELPRO with it is that they mostly use it to try to help ramp up the cyber war. Hmm. Like because like the NSA has lost control of so many different hacking tools. Wasn't there a huge leak at the NSA this it's, past week that didn't get any coverage? Past week, past years. The last two, three years, they've lost so many different hacking tools. Like, I like if you like my laptop, I particularly got this laptop because it doesn't have a webcam in it, you know. And um, I'm getting ready to open up this weekend, and I'm going to just like pre, uh, I've got to be the second Lenovo T400 I have that I've removed the speakers on, hmm. which because you, <laughs> you can use the speakers to turn. You, you can if you. Okay, this is weird. You, uh, you can turn someone's speakers into a microphone. Harry's tech tip for the week. Yeah. You, so how do now, you, now how, that's getting paranoid. That's no, paranoid. No, I and remember that specific that. machine that I'm using it for. So nerdy Chris Spangle didn't play with computers. He played with audio equipment as yeah. a kid. And mm-hmm. so like I would I would have like in my room like I'd take my little tiny you know twenty inch RCA TV with the RCA outputs mm-hmm. and I would I would put those into like ten stereos. Yeah. See how like loud I could get my TV, uh-huh. like because I was I had like I would wire things together or whatever, and I figured out how to turn headphones into a microphone, and oh. you you can turn headphones into a microphone mm-hmm. if you need to, mm-hmm. so it makes total sense. Yeah, and there's an NSA hacking tool that does that that turns speakers into microphones. Mm. So it's like ah, oh, there's no mic hook. They're like, so what? You've got a speakers on that thing, right? Well, crap baskets. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, crap baskets. <laughs> I will put a link to Sovereign Tech on WeAreLibertarians dot com. It's a cool show. It's more so. left leaning than and this is. It's S. Uh, uh, we can just tell people S O V Y R N Tech. You can find them on SoundCloud. S O V Y R N Tech. Yeah, and all one word, right? It's Sovereign Tech. Yeah. All right, because yeah. you slurred all that stuff, so I want to make sure we get yeah. it. Sorry, that's all right. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's what's it's one of uh, it. Uh, I like the podcast. It's it's pretty cool. But uh, the uh, it's it's one of the tech podcasts I listen to. Yeah, cool. and it's the main reason I don't have a tech podcast because he says the things I want to say, so I don't have to do it. Cool. It's easier for me. That's why that's why I do this because nobody else says what I want to say. Yep. Nobody <laughs> nobody seems to understand me either. So I don't know if I'm just insane or if uh, I'm a genius. But Christy even 50, 50, 50, 50. if even Christy Avery Christy Avery in the group chat says I think they're never going to stop. LOL. Uh, yeah, I forgot to stop. Yeah. So I can't stop. stop. We're at two and two hours and twenty minutes, which oh, wow. is uh, long past the hour goal we set for the Tuesday <laughs> shows. But and that's why we can't do radio. Oh no, <laughs> Be- because this was really important, and there was a lot to say here. And uh, I couldn't imagine trying to do this with like a oh, now for a commercial break, uh, dude. I, I know. Yeah, and we have to <laughs> sit here. You, like, imagine giving. Getting amped up, getting into the flow of your comment, mm-hmm. and then you've got to stop halfway through it. Yeah. Like, yeah. literally, you have 30 seconds. So I, I've been talking to people. I've been having people kind of critique the show, and, like, I'm always trying to improve what I do. And I think part of my problem is that I never let there be silence. So, like, I've been watching a lot of Joe Rogan, and uh, Joe just kind of lets – he has a conversation with people. And, you know, he kind of talks like this, and then he, like, stops – and then he waits for them to answer. 
and like my broadcasting, like this is how I normally talk. But when I'm broadcasting, and like Harry paused, I better start talking. Like I need, you know. So I'm trying to get better about that stuff. But like that, like because the broadcasting, you got 30 seconds to get your point out. Yeah, and the yeah, and the pauses. If you pause for too long, you get kicked off the air. The station thinks you're off the air. Exactly. No, literally after I think it's. I think it's five or ten seconds. It depends on the station. Five, ten, fifteen, thirty second settings. If there's silence, then an alarm goes off, and that mm-hmm. sets off a panic in the whole radio station for people to go like turn the station back on. Quick, smooth jazz. Because during the DST, <laughs> during the daylight savings time switchovers here in Indiana, when we didn't do DST, mm-hmm. like two weeks after, it would go all like the computers would get all messed up because we didn't have you don't have board ops anymore. Like that's why I decided to go work in politics because they didn't have those low level entry jobs in radio anymore. Mm-hmm. So I really lucked out getting back into it. I was very, very, very fortunate and very prepared uh to to get the job that I have and I'm just I'm blessed and I love it so much. So they'd be more bored after the FCC didn't like freaking do a stranglehold on the freaking broadcast station. Honestly. You know, it's because of the thing is like would we do radio? Yeah, radio our own what what way. We would just broadcast Amazing, Harry, that you mentioned that. We have our own radio station. You can listen to We Are Libertarians Radio now in iTunes uh, radio. You can listen to us on the website at wearelibertarians.com, or you can listen in tune-in radio. So check out We Are Libertarians Radio. It's fun to kind of tune in and just hear some of those old episodes Mm -hmm. and hear what we were talking about years ago. Uh, So, yeah, really, really fun. Your classic wall. Yep. Yeah, but but back to yeah, that's how I feel about the whole like uh, there's a lot but, but the thing is at the same time, even if it is, WikiLeaks still dumps so much information yeah. out there and it's really, really hard to keep up on all of it. Like going through the Hillary emails, like there's no smoking gun, but there's just just proven damning information of the DNC. Just yep. littered through those Podesta emails, all those different emails. It's just like, well, that, Okay, it's just like, okay, that proves corruption. Just corruption here. And it's like, well, no one will look at it. No one will prove it. And, like, even I thought, like, man, I could probably go through one email of these a day and just do, like, a 10-minute report on this, right? To infinity because there's so much crap here. But no one will care. Yeah. No one will care, you know? And it's like, I can make it searchable, too, but so does Weekly. It's searchable. No one cares. (laughs) Yeah. No one cares. It's like I'm shocked that the DNC still has a brand after all this Bernie Sanders, Donna Brazil thing. But no one cares. Yeah, no one cares. Now, like, like, unlike the, um, you know, the Ron Paul Republicans is like, wow, you screwed us over once, twice. Screw you. We're go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Final. Uh, yeah. No, I've been prolific. I've already done an interview with Kara Schultz, the National Libertarian Party recruiter. Uh, that that will air at some other point. Uh, that's up all, already on the YouTube channel. It's already up. It's up on the YouTube and the okay. Facebook, so she can share it. But like, we yeah. were going to talk Arvin, and I didn't want to like put her in with her boss. I was being critical of her boss, and then like, hey, the Libertarian Party sucks. And by the way, here, yay, Libertarian Party. So, <laughs> uh, so which that could also happen because of the differences in the different sections on it, yeah. and the different um, aspects of like state, national party, and then different like just because of the coast, you know, the size of the freaking thing. I've also done an interview with Boss Hog of Liberty and Tim McGuire. They passed a resolution against Arvind Vora asking mm-hmm. him to resign. And so I set that up and did an interview with them on that resolution that they passed Saturday. That is going to be bonus content. So if you are one of our Patreon subscribers at $5 more a month, then you get that content. $10 up a month and you get... Uh, into the special private Dear Leaders Court where you can participate in the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday nights. I bought a hotspot, so now we're functioning with uh, some bandwidth, and you can actually watch it without it stuttering. Uh, and uh, you can watch the live stream. It's great. It's fun to like see the little comments pop up, and there's a great community around the you know five to ten people watch it every Tuesday and Thursday night. Uh, now. If you're a $25 and up subscriber, you get uh, posters. You get wall posters. And I sent those out this week. Everybody start started receiving those. Thanks, Christy. Uh, yes, thank you, Christy, for helping. And uh, Todd Singer, Christopher Brokoff, Chris, Chad Oakage, Doug Stream, Dan Dunbar, Christian Emmons, Heidi Aldridge, Brandon Kester, Carly Ernst, Pete Jones, Joey Turner, and Brantley Spicer, Jason Doolittle, Craig DaCosta, and Christy Avery all got their posters 
very happy that they like them. Uh, Jason Doolittle is awesome. He's like, he's a, he's a, he, he does woodworking on the side and he's always been a huge supporter of ours. I don't have the camera, but he made me a specially crafted kitty that I have hanging on the wall over here. Oh. And he's going to make a frame for the poster. So great guy. Love Jason and uh, love all of our Patreon sponsors. So if you want that cool limited edition poster, you've got to become a $25 a month and up Patreon subscriber. That helps us continue to grow, to do more, to uh, get more resources out there so we can create more libertarians and get you informed. Uh, and if you want to hear that bonus interview with the Boss Hog of Liberty, Tim McGuire, about the inner workings of the Libertarian Party, then go check out that on the private RSS feed on the Patreon. Um, Thursday, I will be talking with two veterans. I actually got two messages from two veterans who one is Libertarian Curious and the other is... Uh, a devoted wall fan, and they served in the military, and they said, you know, I'm so pissed off about Arvin's comments that I want to just, I just want people to hear what it's actually like to serve in the military. So we'll be doing that live Thursday night from a super secret location. Uh, so we've got that. Looking forward to that. Uh, check out the website. Harry, final thoughts for this episode? Anything? Did I already do final thoughts with you? I forget. I think you, yeah, you, for the uh, those stories, yeah. You, you and, deserve a second one. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, w all that it does is like is when you get when you receive information from any source or for any article, just make sure you weigh the evidence, look at it, understand biases. Just because something is comes from a bias source, just understands where their biases are, and right. also look at their sources and see where everything is comes from. It's just it just how you weigh evidence. It's just how you'd go through it. Uh, that's what I've got to say about those different things. Also, like uh, it's okay to come at something with many different answers, and then also to understand to ask people different questions to how how they, how they come up to their conclusions. Because everyone is an individual, and they'll come up with their own different questions. That's the beauty of libertarianism. That's you know that's the beauty of it. We can do this different thing. Um, the other thing, um, let's see. Um, I'm going to um, pimp out the uh, Discord again. So, uh, Discord, we have a lot more fun. Over on the Discord, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, just be careful. Uh, you know, I have started. Like I said, I put everyone in the starter zone, which is there's the safe a zone. there's a lot of Asian cartoons that I don't understand there. Uh, yeah, there's some of that. Um, there's some ponies, uh, <laughs> which we, I'm not against. Uh, then we've got a. No, we just started a, a South Park channel from. Uh, um, I got Harry's duper, uh, super duper fan. Larry, uh, we they, they started the uh, we started our uh, so started the South Park channel. There is a wall. There's ESPN Ocho for our wall sports. Until you know, we get if someone wants to do take a ball and run with that. That's there's people there that want that in that Discord. I'm a, I'm a DMZ guy. I I like to hang out there with Dennis and and a demo whatever. I don't know who that one is. Uh, no names, man. No names. I don't know it's who all, any of the people I'm conversing with are. It's, it's all usernames. That's the best part about it. It's like you could get on with a username. You don't want to know who you are. I don't care either. Just come in and just talk. Talk yeah. freely. I'm not, I'm not going to dox you. I, 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 I log in there, and I'm like, all right, Asian cartoon, Asian cartoon. Ooh, a booby. Asian cartoon, <laughs> Asian cartoon. Uh, <laughs> oh, screech, screech, Asian cartoon. Yeah. Another booby. Screech, screech. Yeah. And it's then, funny. Uh, and, yeah, and we still hang out on Friday nights. We sit around and game and drink and uh, um, shit post it live. Uh, we uh, usually when usually after I want to say like two a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is uh, which was just two a.m. across the board. Anyways, so when it's two a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you know when everyone's like either tired of the game or we drunk enough, we kind of just start shit posting with each other. Yeah. You know, which is kind of like I I'm a very afraid like some something's going to happen and we're all going to be in that chat room together and we're all just going to attack something one time. It's going to happen. I don't Leroy know when. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> and some page is just going to go like, what is going on? God damn Where it, Where are these memes coming from? <laughs> you got, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty fun. I, I wake up Saturday mornings and I'm like, what the hell happened in here? Yeah. I don't understand any of it because, like, I, I'm not into gaming culture. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. It's like sports to me. I don't get sports. And, and the best part about it, when you're done, like, I'm not going to read all 300 Marcus Red and move on. Yeah. Mark is ready to move on. I'm like, not reading any of that. I, 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 do, that I do a little scanning. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's all I have. Uh, we may have a wall sports show coming soon. Can you believe that? Wall sports? I will, I will not listen to that, but 
some people might want to. I don't, I'm just kidding. Uh, Shane came up with the idea, and so we might try it out. So we'll see. Um, so if you are a sports fan and you may or may not want to be involved in a sports podcast, uh, then hit me up. All right. Editor at We Libertarians, my voice is starting to go. Uh, yes. Well, especially with um, um, politics and sports, it keeps crossing back and forth. That'd yeah. be nice to kick those stories down there. Like exactly. The, um, uh, Trump um, saved at a UCL basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> um, he God, broke California. I, uh, you know. I, Winning. I, I really, if you missed the Trump tweet, by the way, I feel like I can't end this show without reading the oh, great, read. not just the greatest Donald Trump tweet of all time, mm-hmm. but literally the greatest tweet maybe ever posted. Uh, it was so good. It was the best tweet. I get on Twitter, and I love it. Uh, yes, there will be salary caps. <laughs> there will be salary caps on Wall Sports. Uh, the salary will be nothing, because that's what I can You're afford. Cap sport. it right around there. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I wish that I could get to this. I am sorry, but it's going to be worth it. I promise you. It's so good. He's been in Asia, so he's, you know, that's one thing about the Roy Moore story is that uh, he really has an opportunity. And I wish I had said this early, earlier in the show because it is a, an interesting political thing for Donald Trump because he could, he, this is one of the times where he has the deciding vote. Like the uh, the governor basically called this special election and she doesn't want to she could cancel the election and re like move it again but she doesn't want to do it without Donald Trump's permission essentially um the Trump could come out and say we as a party are going to stand for what's right we're not going to do this and could kill more and get him out of the race and the party could move on like Mo Brooks who like Mo Brooks was the congressman that saved ever like Steve Scalise's life at the congressional shooting, and Mo Brooks is actually like fairly in line with Donald Trump, and he ended up supporting Luther Strange, and uh, Lu- like Alabama has this weird law where you you could put Luther Strange on the ballot as an independent in the way that uh, Murkowski did in Alaska. Mm-hmm. At where she won as an independent, but she's a Republican. She just got lost in a primary and put herself on as an independent and won. And that could happen with Luther Strange, but the Alabama Republican State Party passed a sore loser law that says any Republican that loses in a race can't run for another six years. Oh, so wow. he's Yeah, so he's hesitant about running again. But uh, Donald Trump is... People aren't loyal to Roy Moore in Alabama. They're loyal to Donald Trump. Like, Alabama is Donald Trump country. And so whatever Donald Trump says about Roy Moore when he gets back from the Asia trip, is it's really interesting to see how that's going to shake out. So um, I, I'm looking forward to that. Now, Donald Trump on November 11th, he's been touring Asia, South Korea, China, the Philippines, all over the place. And November 11th, he tweeted, why would Kim Jong-un insult me by calling me old when I would never call him, quote unquote, short and fat? (laughs) Oh, well, I try so hard to be his friend and maybe someday that will happen. (laughs) I, I, I didn't think that was real and I cannot believe that's real. I don't know what he's thinking. Like he's, he's insane. Um, so yeah, really interesting political times. Uh, thank God Hillary Clinton didn't win. <laughs> like we'd have gun confiscation right now because of the Texas shootings and Donald Trump just makes it so fun and funny. All right. Thank you. Listen, guys, every single action in your day is a choice to be good or bad. And, uh, that's where the binary exists. So make sure that when you hit publish in the world, you are, uh, publishing responsibly. Because you have the power to sway elections now. Like, the hive that is social media, we control it. And uh, you have the power to destroy lives and careers. You have the power to embolden child molesters. You have the power to promote things that you love, destroy things that you hate, destroy things that you love. 
So every tweet, every Facebook comment, every Facebook post, every Instagram post, it's all power at this point. And uh, we're, we're seeing that enacted, and it's a great power for us to have, but we should use it wisely. So with that being said, we will see you Thursday. And until then, be good to each other. Woo!